definitely. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Oh, Hi. Shoot. Um, you just missed it. <laughs> missed what, Jeff? I'm not sure what you're talking about. Nothing. Stuff. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Or maybe, like, I could say something really stupid and wacky like you blowing your nose. <laughs> well. But, of course, that wouldn't be true. I mean, oh, look. No, that's exactly what you missed. Uh, this is going to be fun tonight. Um, yeah, it's great. Allergies. We Both should. Allergies. Yeah, or allergy medicine. I've taken so much. Please, no more medicine. <laughs> I can't. Okay. Well, so, hey, everybody in the chat. Uh, we are uh, going to start the show soon. Uh, Steph has a hard out at uh, around seven, seven o'clock. Well, two hours, yeah. And um, Rick is hopefully going to join us. He said he would, uh, but he has a uh, personal, um, something personal going on right now. And uh, so we're hoping that uh, when that's all finished, he'll be able to join us. Uh, Nick is not joining us at all, except for some a, an audio recording that he did for us. Um, we'll be playing that in the Getting to Know Us segment. What'd you say, Liz? And, yeah, so a couple of pictures from his location. Well, I guess his, where he was. I think he's driving. He's either driving home right now or he's home from driving back from Cornwall. I hope or he's home. It's like 10 p.m. Cornhole. Corn. Like I'm pretty sure that's the name of it. Corn job. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. His secret lair. Ah. All right. Yeah, so uh, when, hopefully, when Rick joins us, it'll be like uh, back in 20, retro, 2015 retro. Mm -hmm. Old when, school. Uh, not yeah. old, old school. Just Not old, old, old yeah. Older, it's... oldish school. Yeah, if Steph leaves and Rick's not here, then it will it will it'll really be sure old be school. Old That'll school. be OG. <laughs> OG airline pilot guy. And then it'll be like, oh, crud, I have to keep talking constantly. We have faith in you, Jeff. We know you can do yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Glad somebody does. All right. Uh, let me start my recorder. Wait, let me do something here. Uh, oh, did you want me to do that? Uh, I, I guess. Let's see. All right, I'm not getting any error messages on my. Please remind me to stop it whatever time I actually Zoom do. Leave. I know I will say I I'll try to remember maybe because I have I'll a thirteen day file us. from apparently the last time I was. <laughs> yeah, I, I I think you were out flying or something, and when I remembered. Steph, yeah, and I your... said <laughs> nope, <laughs> definitely nope. didn't stop that. <laughs> and then I still didn't remember to turn it off when I got home apparently, for two weeks. Oh man. Well, good thing you have a big hard drive. Mm, well, thank you for noticing. I I said hard drive. Oh, okay. Yes. My computer does have a large hard drive. <laughs> Wait a minute. Hang on. Oh, let me, let me take a look. Yeah. Got a big hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Oh, yeah. Good point. Uh, thank you. Let me see if I can find that. <laughs> mm -hmm. 16 inches high. It's the size of my hard drive. Very impressive. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, hi, Nick. Nick is here. Very impressive. Oh, wait. How, how, was, your, uh, how was your vacation? Oh, my camera's broken. Oh, sorry. Did you drop <laughs> it? <laughs> so, so did your next <laughs> so we really don't ocean need... there in the okay. sea? No, I, I prefer seamen. Yeah, that's what we've heard. <laughs> That's fun. This is almost better than having Nick here. <laughs> I was just going to say, we don't really need him here. We just have enough clips to, you know, have commentary, rude commentary from Nick all show long. Yeah, but that's not him saying it, though. No, that's somebody else. Yeah, that's all right. Um, do I have any other things of him saying stuff? No, um, I think we have. Where's the Boeing one? Um, no. Oh, um, 
Hang on. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, da, da, da. I know, we're just fooling around here, everybody. <laughs> Sorry. But this is... Uh, oh, here we go. It ain't Boeing, I ain't going. Did, you probably didn't hear that, did you? You did? Oh, okay, good. I heard it. That's 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 Nick, because he loves Boeings. It ain't Boeing, I ain't going. <laughs> All right. Well, so there you go. Uh, we are... I'm so glad um, I started my recorder for you, Jeff. Um, you're going to have a lot of interesting sounds to deal with on my oh boy. audio recording if I send well, hopefully it to I you. Won't, hopefully I won't need it. <laughs> Fingers crossed. What, what, she's, what she's saying there, for those who aren't in the know, um, if... Um, so we, I have everybody usually recording their local audio just in case something goes wonky with the, uh, with the internet. And, uh, a couple of times I've had to do that. And, uh, when we're on the show, when Steph sneezes or makes any kind of noise, <laughs> um, sneezes, the, uh, mostly sneezes, yeah, sneezes <laughs> mostly, or coughs or something, um, she mutes herself so we don't hear it. Yeah. But on the local recording, it's not, it, it's like constant. There's no, it just keeps going. Yeah. Yeah. It, just it scares the sometimes. crap out of Jeff every yeah, single so time. Doing something all of a sudden she'll sneeze and go, what? Oh, wow. <laughs> Have a little heart attack. Uh, oh, thank you, Stephen. Yes, yes, yes. I forgot about that one too. Uh, here we go. Can we just record it as that and just have that as like his intro music one day, but don't tell him. <laughs> just, just, just the, the, no, 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 in the background the whole time, and like all the other yeah. clips overlaid over it. Don't tell him you're going to do that. Just okay. intro yeah, music. I'll do that next time. He's on. Perfect. All right. Of course, he's probably watching this because this is being recorded. Yeah, so. He probably is. I could always Darn trim it. it so that it starts right when we right start now. Yeah. Okay. Well, why don't we do that? Uh, let me okay. do a check on. Uh... Roger, you ready? Sound check. You're listening to the Airline Pilot Guy Show. The view from our side of the cockpit door. Good. Didn't blow you out? Okay. All good. All right. My SD card is in. It's uh, recording. And let me see. Let me go to the little script here. Of course, I'll have time to pull that up when start playing the intro. All right. I think we're ready to go. So let's call it nine after. Okay. You're listening to the airline pilot guy show. The view from our side of the cockpit door. W-A-P-G. It's the airline pilot guy. Airline pilot guy episode 474. Hello, you're listening to the Airline Pilot Guy Show. The view from our side of the cockpit door with your host, Captain Jeff, broadcasting live from Studio 1A at APG headquarters in Roswell, Georgia. Today's show is recorded on the 27th of May, 2021. today's episode, Belarus violates aviation norms by forcing an international flight to land and arresting an opposition journalist on board. The NTSB blames the pilots for a Texas plane crash two years ago, which killed 10 people. More news, your feedback, and today's plane tale. So get all settled in. Tray tables and seat backs in the upright and locked positions. Electronic devices powered on. I'm Radio Roger, and Flight 474 is ready for pushback. 
Thank you, Radio Roger. He is an award-winning TV and radio reporter currently at the number one all-news station in the nation. 10-10 wins in New York City. Welcome to the Airline Pilot Guy Show. It is an aviation podcast where we talk about aviation news and answer your great feedback. I'm Captain Jeff, a pilot at a major legacy airline based in Atlanta, Georgia. And joining me today from her lakeside studio in South... Doctor, skydiver, marathon runner, sprint training junkie, IPA connoisseur, and commercial multi-engine instrument rated backstabbing jumper, dumper. Ca- not captain, doctor stuff. I'm the captain now. <laughs> I mean, that yes. means. Uh, I was also going to add to it, and apparently allergy sufferer, so my apologies uh-huh. right off the bat for scratchy voice, occasional sniffles, uh, sneezing, coughing, all that stuff. I will try to mute as I am able to. So we don't have to. You, sound you like all don't commercial. have to suffer with me. <laughs> yeah, I think like it's um, Nyquil or Dayquil or yeah. Alka Seltzer or something. I don't know. And what's really amazing is that uh, right before you said allergy sufferer, that's what Liz said as well in my in my ear. So, <laughs> Great uh, minds think alike, Jeff. Yes. Great minds think Not alike. Not sure about that, but okay. Um, let's uh, let's get right on with the news. Stand by for news. Okay, the first thing we're going to talk about, we have talked about this accident in previous, uh, at least on a previous episode, maybe episodes, uh, and they now have a, uh, I think it's the final report, isn't it? Um, yeah, final report. So this accident uh, occurred back in June of 2019, so almost two years ago. Um, the failure of a pilot, by the way, this is from the NTSB.gov, a press release from them. The failure of a pilot to control an airplane following the loss of thrust in one of two engines just seconds after takeoff led to the fatal crash of a general aviation airplane in Texas, the National Transportation Safety Board said in a report published Tuesday. A Textron Aviation B-300, also known as a King Air 350, crashed into an aircraft hangar 17 seconds after lifting off a runway at Addison Airport, Addison, Texas, on June 30th, 2019. The accident killed both pilots and all eight passengers. The personal flight on the privately owned airplane was bound for St. Petersburg, Florida. Investigators analyzed flight track data broadcast by the airplane, video from multiple cameras on, on and off the airport, as well as the known flight performance data and characteristics of the airplane to recreate the accident flight path and determine the airplane's position, speed, altitude, and roll angles. The NTSB said in its report that after the left engine lost almost all thrust several seconds after takeoff, the pilot responded to the emergency with left rudder input, the opposite action of what the emergency called for. Seconds later, the pilot applied right rudder, but by that point the airplane was rolling inverted and there was insufficient altitude for recovery. Investigators determined that had the pilot initially applied right rudder input, which would be the correct rudder input, the airplane would have been controllable. The audio from the cockpit voice recorder revealed the pilots did not call for any of the checklists that would typically be used before takeoff, nor did they discuss what they would do in the case of a loss of engine thrust on takeoff or any other emergency procedure. The NTSB said... The pilot's failure to follow checklists and adhere to the airplane manufacturer's emergency procedures contributed to the accident. A detailed examination of the left engine and its control systems found no condition that would have prevented normal operation. The NTSB noted that there was a known risk of an unintentional movement of an engine power lever if its friction lock was adjusted incorrectly. Friction lock settings? are one of the items in the pre-takeoff checklist that the pilots failed to use. Investigators were unable to determine if the friction lock settings played a role in the loss of thrust on the left engine. The cause for a loss of engine thrust could not be determined. And that was because I think most of the throttle quadrant and all that part of the airplane um, suffered a lot of damage in the Mm post-crash fire. 
so they couldn't really tell uh, with any certainty what the friction lock, you know, was what position it was in. And the full report will be uh, in the show notes uh, for you to read if you'd like. It's it's a quite long um, document. Uh, forgot how many pages. It's it twenty-two is, pages. It's, uh, twenty-two, 22 pages. Twenty-two pages. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it seems, Steph, that a lot of these engine failure and then crashes right after takeoff happen quite often, or maybe it's just coincidental on the uh, the Beechcraft King Airs. Um, it, yeah, so I have very little time in a King Air, but I've talked to folks who fly the King Air, and if you are out there and fly the King Air, um, it's, things happen fast in that aircraft. Mm -hmm. So if you have an emergency, it tends to be a little on the, the twitchy side. That's the technical mm -hmm. term for it. So oh, yeah, twitchy. Um, if you're not, yeah, if you're not right on, yeah, twitchy, twitchy. Um, <laughs> You know, but I, I think what they're getting at is that there are other aircraft, multi-engine aircraft that are a little bit more, things just happen a little slower when you have a, an emergency like this, not so much in the, in the King Air. So um, if you apply incorrect rudder input with a, an engine failure, um, it's going to be a lot less, uh, or it's not going to be very forgiving at all, which is obviously what happened here. You know, initially mm -hmm. he they had the left engine failure and he applied uh, left rudder input probably only momentarily, you know, uh, this was only 17 seconds after takeoff anyway, um, mm -hmm. probably re immediately realized it. And it was just by the time he got the, the right rudder um, input in, it was too late. Um, so, yeah. And, and, you know, the, the NTSB, I think, is kind of hinting at a lot of things here that they don't, uh, you know, just all those uh, Swiss cheese holes that we talk about in terms of, hey, you know, they didn't run the pre-takeoff checklist. So potentially did they not do something with the um, friction lock there. So was it something that um, contributed? You know, I think they're they're kind of hinting at, you know, hey, if you're a pilot out there and you're reading this report, um, these are things you need to keep in mind every single flight so that you don't put yourself in this situation. Right. And what's sad about it is that it sounds to me like they're kind of intimating that it was a perfectly good air, uh, engine. Yeah, just kind yeah. Of, they couldn't find um, a specific reason why it lost thrust. So, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the uh, the co-pilot um, didn't have the certification or type rating to uh, actually fly that particular airplane, and I guess it was the policy um, of the the company or whatever that flies the airplane that uh, mm -hmm. only the captain would be um, manipulating or touching the controls sure. um, when passengers were on board. Sure. And um, so they're they're surmising that the uh, the co-pilot just kept hands off the entire time. But he did mention to the to the uh, captain or the uh, the pilot um, in uh, pilot in command that the uh, the rudder should be the right rudder. Uh, but by that time, I think he had already pressed uh, the uh, left rudder, the wrong rudder, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, it was just it was just too late and not enough altitude to. Uh, to recover. Yeah, this was right on right on takeoff. Um, so a lot of in, uh, input already from our, our chat room here, folks who have experience or experience in similar aircraft. So one comment says they fly the from Dale. Uh, he flies the Beach 1900 Stretch King Air, essentially, which has an auto feather system, um, which is a no go item on the 1900. Um, and then Pilot Pip is there, and he says it has auto feather but no rudder boost. So these are all things that will help um in the event of a engine failure um but i don't think this particular model had doesn't yeah i feather. don't know that the king air has a by default has an auto feather system they think it's an option nope. to order so i looked at the report and it uh, said that uh, that was one of the uh, steps of the emergency procedure um if you lose engine power oh, is sure. to yep. feather the yep, uh, absolutely the, uh, the engine so i don't think there mm -hmm. was an auto feather on this feather and secure yep exactly so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he didn't do any of that um, yeah, and I mean, also he was known seconds to, too, so. mm -hmm. He was also known to have um, the reputation uh, that he just never runs checklists or briefs anything. Oh, so yeah, that's not a good. Yeah. That's not a great reputation to uh, to have. Well, he made it to seventy-one years of age, and uh, apparently he suffered from sleep apnea as well. So they think that that may have contributed as well as far as physiological factors in this. Yeah, that's uh, that's lots of stuff. Probably hard to say. Like I said, they hinted a lot of things in here. Um, nothing that you could probably say 
absolutely were contributing, but potentially contributing, mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah. A lot more detail on the uh, actual NTSB report, so y'all should check it out. I think that's every everybody, even you know people that don't fly multi-engine airplanes or or fly uh, turboprops can can learn something there's, from this and understand. There's always something the to be learned from accident reports. Um, right. You know, read them. Make sure you don't put yourself in those situations, if if at all possible. Yeah, and what's really sad, Liz and I were talking about this before we recorded. Uh, you know, the the eight passengers that hired uh, this airplane to take them to St. Petersburg, they're expecting that the, the flight crew is going to be competent and be able to handle any situation. That's what you're trained for, right? Sure. And uh, sadly, it didn't work out that way. Oh. Huh. All right. Yes. Okay, you just cut out, Liz. I'm sorry. Uh, Liz was talking to me about oh. something. You might want to, she says, you might want to mention, and then it goes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's gone. Yeah, I don't hear you at all, Liz, on clean feed. Okay. <laughs> We're just going to move on. All right. Uh, the second item that we have in our news notebook is uh, an update on the crash of the Srivijaya. Let me see how I, how I did with that. Um, hang on. I can hear you now, yes. Um, okay, let's see. Sh Shwe okay, Liz says I have to say it in a higher voice. Sh uh, you have to sing it too, remember? Oh yeah, Shrivijaya. Well, hang on. Srivijaya. How's that? See? Srivijaya. <laughs> Air. Um, <laughs> 737-500 that crashed. Uh, they took off out of Jakarta on January 9th, 2021. They lost height and impacted the Java Sea. On May 18th, 2021, the FAA released their airworthiness directive AD 2021-08-14, stating... This airworthiness directive was prompted by a flap synchro wire failure that may go undetected by the auto throttle computer. This AD requires repetitive bite, which stands for built in test equipment. So it requires repetitive bite tests of the auto throttle computer to detect a flap synchro wire failure and corrective action if necessary. The FAA is issuing this AD to address the unsafe condition on these products. Um, let's see. The FAA argued uh, the FAA previously issued AD 2023-34, Amendment 39, blah, 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 in December of 2000, which applies to all Boeing Model 737, 300, 400, and 500 series airplanes and requires replacing the existing autothrottle computer with a new improved autothrottle computer that included an asymmetric cruise thrust monitor. On January 9th, 2021, the uh, Srivijaya Air was uh, involved in an accident um, and there were 62 fatalities. Okay, we already knew this. This is um, just kind of recapping the uh, accident here. Um, at this time, the preliminary data uh, on of the ongoing accident investigation shows that it is highly unlikely that the accident resulted from the latent failure of the flap synchro wire. However, the FAA has determined that the unsafe condition identified in this AD could exist or develop in model 737, 300, 400, and 500 series airplanes, and that this AD is therefore necessary to address the identified unsafe condition. Uh, the FAA has confirmed that accomplishment of the applicable bite test in the existing airplane maintenance manual detects the flap synchro wire failure. I'm not really sure what a flap synchro wire does, except that maybe it, it uh, looks at the flaps on both wings and if makes sure a, that there, there's no discrepancy between the that's two. That's what it sounds like, yeah. The synchronization yeah. of the flaps extending and... Yeah. Oh, we need the Wikipedia, Liz says. Yeah, where are you, Rick? Come on. Get off the phone and join us. <laughs> um, but 
anyway, I actually did uh, tell Rick that he should, you know, look up if he doesn't already know, which I'm sure he probably already does know what a flap synchro wire is, that he should brush up on it and he can tell us all about it. But he's not here to tell us, so oh well. Yeah, yeah, that's what we think too, Dale. Split flap protection. Um, but then it also talks about cruise thrust uh, asymmetry as well. Uh, so I guess it's a whole bunch of different components tied into that uh, flap synchro wire. Uh, again, kind of you know, kind of hinting that maybe this had something to do, maybe not the cause of the crash, but something that may have occurred that perhaps distracted the flight crew or something and let and didn't you know mind the store and keep flying the airplane and the airplane just got went out of control i don't know that's all speculation of course but just odd that it's kind of mentioned in the on, ongoing investigation of the uh of the uh Sri Vijaya. air um Sri investigation Vijaya. <laughs> I think Liz is enjoying that. That's good. We're getting some <laughs> entertainment value. <laughs> uh, yes, you are easily entertained. Okay. Anything uh, to add or subtract? Uh, stuff? I mean, I could probably subtract a lot from it. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> the Swirajaya yeah. era. Swirajaya. Yeah, that's <laughs> nailed it. Um, I know. Oops. <laughs> I no, I don't. That. I don't know anything about these systems, unfortunately. So, unless Rick joins us later on and can add something more to what you've already read from Damn the stuff, you. I'm sorry. Not I'm good just, for anything. I know. <laughs> I'm useless today. Um, <laughs> just, just go blow your nose. I'll move on. I'm going to to the next <laughs> <laughs> next news item. Uh, let's see here. By the way, for those listening only to the uh, audio only, uh, Steph is suffering from allergies. Of course kind of mentioned that at the very beginning okay uh this uh item c is an ins oh this is this is an uh, yeah interesting this is one. this is news um yes definitely news yeah um sent in by many of you uh who listen to the show and um one of whom uh will identify as texas and shock and he sent a link to this article about the uh, Ryanair that was basically hijacked by um, a state, um, Belarus. Anyway, he says, needless to say, there will be fallout from this. Many countries have already condemned the action, but I find myself wondering what the ramifications for aviation will be. I would think carriers in the region would be a little more wary about flying through their airspace considering this flight wasn't even heading there. It was just passing through or passing over. Uh, would they go as far as trying to route flights completely around Belarus? Yeah. Uh, it's not the largest country in the region, It's still, but it's still a fairly sizable one. Love to hear your take on this. So, Okay, so the article that uh, everybody was pointing us to, or one very similar to this one, um, and this one is from Aviation Herald, the Ry uh, Ryanair Sun... B737-800 uh, near Minsk on May 23rd, 2021, uh, which Greece called a uh, the diversion a state hijack. Uh, let's see, they were performing flight 4978 from Athens to Vilnius, Lithuania, with 126 passengers and six crew, was en route at flight level 390, about 45 nautical miles south of Vilnius, still in Belarus airspace. When the aircraft diverted to Minsk in Belarus, uh, located about 90 nautical miles east of their present position, where the aircraft landed safely about 25 minutes later. Now, I have, a, I have two questions. Um, or, yeah, like, okay, they're at flight level 390, and they're only 45 nautical miles south of the airport that they were intending to land on. Slam that, dunk. Yeah, that's, like, <laughs> really steep not gonna, descent. Not, yeah, yeah. Um, not a typical airline mm -mm. flight descent. And mm -mm. then the other thing is... Why go um, 90 nautical miles out of your way if you need to be on the ground sooner rather than later and your intended point of yes. landing is 45 nautical miles? I right. have the same questions, so Jeff. I have the same twi questions. Twice as far. Um, and I guess they were intercepted by a MiG-29, I believe, fighter. 
that had uh, been Great. dispatched to intercept and force the Boeing to land at Minsk. Now, the reason for this forced diversion was they claimed that there was some sort of a bomb threat. And let me see if I can find the, uh, uh, let's see. It was, uh, you said something about it being uh, called in from Switzerland. But um, the Swiss said, uh, yeah, we don't know what they're talking about because um, we didn't receive any kind of a bomb threat and we didn't contact the country of Belarus to let them know that the airplane had a bomb threat. I can't find it now for some reason. Anyway, um, so that was the, uh, the, the purported uh, reason that the uh, airplane was intercepted by the MiG-29 and forced to land in Minsk. Um, let's see. The circumstances of the diversion are entirely unclear. No official confirmation is available so far. Of course, we know a little bit more now since this article was written. Um, turns out that um, they landed. They took out a bunch. Of, I saw a picture of uh, all the bags on the on the ramp being supposedly uh, inspected for a bomb, um, and then almost all the passengers got back on the airplane, except for I think now the official word is five passengers, uh, one of whom uh, his name is uh, Roman. Protasevich, or Protasevich, uh, who is threatened with the death penalty because he, let's see, he has uh, run a channel on Telegraph uh, called, where was all this information I had? Now I can't find. Um, anyway, uh, he's an opposition, he's a journalist. He's also an activist against the present um, government of Belarus, and they consider him a... Um, a problem and a terrorist in their words and that um, they uh, wanted to I guess they just wanted to talk to him and so they forced the airplane down and he and uh, his fiance um, I think it was a fiance or a girlfriend um, were taken off the airplane along with three Russians who didn't get back on the airplane to continue their hmm. trip to Lithuania so little uh yeah, she was a girlfriend, fiance, Russian citizen. And also, I've been reading some news reports since this uh, that um, they have been torturing um, the uh, the young man. And okay. uh, it's a big mess. Yeah, definitely, um, you know, involving aviation, but very political in nature, uh, or completely political in nature, I should say. Okay. Um, Let's see. But we can go back um, up to, the, we have some questions um, oh, do we? About this from the from an aviation standpoint. Okay. Did we read that already from Texas and Uh, yeah. He said, "What? What read. were the implications yeah. for the aviation?" Yeah. And yes, uh, there have already been. Well, go ahead, Steph. You probably know. Yeah, I mean, there's there's certainly airlines already who are not going to be overflying that airspace for the time being, perhaps foreseeable future. Um, can't take the risk that they'd be perhaps carrying a, a passenger of interest to Belarus who might uh, decide to force them to land there as well so that they could detain their passengers and, um, you know, create more political havoc. Um, I think that's probably going to be the, the biggest issue, uh, you know, aside from, um, yeah, just, I, I mean, fortunately it's not a, a huge country, so it's not like you're having to avoid, you know, say, all of Russia or Canada or China or something like that, but still, it's um, it's an inconvenience for airlines, flight planning. And wise. some were saying it's a kind of a to to kind of ban flights from overflying Belarus. It's it the there's a like a, another problem because it's that's next to Ukraine and there are already parts of Ukraine that are kind of off limits for several. So it's sure. Like so you a start putting all that together. Big chunk of geography together. that they're having to go around. Um, and uh, yeah, not not a good situation there. Um, yeah, several several countries have already banned their uh, their airlines from flying over that airspace, and uh, the uh, 
Na- I think it's a national airline of Belarus, um, Belavia, has canceled flights to eight countries, it said in the statement. Flights to a number of destinations, including Amsterdam, Berlin, Barcelona, and the Russian city of Kalin- Kal- Kalin- Kaliningrad? I'm not sure. Uh, would be canceled until October 30th due to several countries imposing flight bans on it. Uh, Air France canceled a flight between Paris and Moscow on Wednesday after failing to receive Russian authorization to bypass the Belarusian airspace. Okay, so that's another, I guess, kink in the uh, Mm -hmm. situation there because they have to get overflight permission from Russia, and Russia is saying no. No. (laughs) So it's it's a mess. Uh, this is really, and it's against the, um, several people have said the Chicago Convention, I think is what they are stating, uh, to prevent something like this from happening. And uh, basically, Belarus says, well, oh, well. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure that yeah. Belarus is particularly worried about that at the moment. Um, no. Not at all. So it's really, it, th- this is concerning. I mean, th- this is the uh, way, like, yeah. major... <laughs> Uh, major conflicts are started yeah exactly you know yeah so yes i am liz (laughs) liz says are you glad you fly domestically jeff (laughs) yes yes i'm happy to fly in the domestic united states of america Mm -hmm. yeah i'm sorry go ahead Steph. oh i I forgot what i was gonna say i'm sorry that's Ah. okay okay it wasn't anything super important Anyway, uh, yeah, uh, seems that KGB agents were inside the airplanes. Yeah, uh, apparently. Well, clearly they had access to the you know passenger manifests and knew who mm-hmm. was on board, and that was someone they wanted to talk to. And they said, "Oh, look at this! This guy's going to yeah. fly right over our airspace, and this will be the perfect opportunity for us to intercept and get him on the ground, and um, you know, try to get information out of him that we would like, and maybe yeah. not the best ways possible." No. Yeah. And as I mentioned, uh, one of the news articles here from um, MSN News said that uh, there is a video of him and it appears to several people uh, that uh, he has been tortured and uh, looks like there was some kind of a scar or or wound that they had tried to cover up with uh, with makeup. Yeah, it's just really, yeah, it's chilling, actually, very chilling. Ah, so hopefully uh, we do need Jason Bourne. Thank you, Liz. Where is he when you need him? All right. Now, or, or Bond. James Bond. All right. Some sort of intelligence agent. Operative. Right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what? No intelligence in our show? Is that what you're saying, Liz? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wham. Butt slam. All right, let's. By the way, don't look that up on Google. <laughs> I yeah, um, I have questions, but I'm not going to seek the answers. Good. Moving on. Yeah, just trust me on that. Okay, uh, let's see the next item. Let's move on quickly. Uh, this is oh, this is another interesting one. Uh, Arion. We've been talking about Arion supersonic, quite a bit on our show in, in recent episodes. Uh, Arion Supersonic, which had touted plans to build a $375 million jet building facility at Orlando, Mel- it's not even near, well, it's, I guess, sort of close to Orlando, the Melbourne International Airport. Yeah, abruptly announced Friday it was shutting down. The AS2 Supersonic Business Jet Program meets all market technical, regulatory, and sustainability requirements. And the market for a new supersonic segment of general aviation has been validated with $11.2 billion in sales backlog for the AS2, a company statement released Friday afternoon said. Oh, it sounds like an exciting announcement. However, comma, in the current financial environment, it has proven hugely challenging to close on the scheduled and necessary large new capital requirements to finalize the transition of the AS2 into production. The statement said, given these conditions, the Arion Corporation is now taking the appropriate steps in consideration of this ongoing financial environment. So basically, (laughs) they they put the kibosh on this whole thing. Now, I don't know Mm -hmm. if it's a permanent thing or just a temporary, 
um, set back, but it looks pretty seriously like it's they're giving up. And I, I'm really kind of surprised because we've talked about the fact that several big name companies involved in aviation, like Boeing, like General Electric, have been, you know, investing a lot of money in this. In fact, Boeing announced a partnership that included a significant investment in engineering, manufacturing, and flight, flight test resources. Uh, also, they were going to put in some marketing efforts behind the AS-2. Um, Spirit Aerosystems, not the airline, but the, the company that makes fuselages for several of the Boeing jets, or at least the 737 jets, um, announced a collaborative agreement for the development of the pressurized forward fuselage and they were going to make several of those for the company. But, and then, of course, FlexJet, back in 2015, I believe, um, put in orders for 20 of the jets, which was like over, I don't know, well, it was $120 million a piece. So do the math. A lot of money um, involved in that. And then, of course, we heard recently that NetJets also put in um, not firm orders, but uh, options, or I'm not sure exactly their intention yeah, what, yeah, letter of intent, intent to purchase like 20 of them, but that wasn't as solid as the as the uh, FlexJet um, commitment to buy these jets. And just kind of scratching my head, you know, I, I was mentioning to Liz when we were talking about this earlier in the week that uh, I fly into Melbourne on occasion, and last few times I was there, I was kind of looking, you know, right, it's right across from where our terminal is in our gates. And I'm looking at the hangar area where they're going to build this big uh, construction facility, and I'm thinking it doesn't look like anything is going on over there. I mean, it's hmm. just like kind of suspicious. Quiet. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. I thought, why? I thought I would think by now that there would be because they were talking about getting this thing and... going, like yeah, soon. And uh, yeah, nothing. Nothing looked like it was happening, and so maybe they've been having issues with financing. Capital well, that's basically what they're saying. Yeah, they weren't able to get the, you know, the upfront capital that they needed to get things going. Yeah, they have a lot of mm -hmm. orders, but how much of that is actual money in their pockets right at this moment they can use to build a production facility and actually manufacture aircraft? Mm -hmm. Probably not a lot of it. No, apparently not. Yeah, represents future earnings from sales of aircraft, but no. Dale Williams says, Arion, thanks to COVID, time is not an issue. Everything can be done via Zoom. Well, could be part of it as well. Yeah. But Which, I, yeah, I speed of, they... and Arnie says, they did not manage to soften the supersonic boom to allow flight over populated areas. Well, they, well, I don't, I don't know if that's the issue or not. I mean, is it an engineering technological issue that they weren't able to accomplish? Um, I mean, the, the article makes it sound it? more like a financial issue. It sure does. Um, yeah. Which I could see. And um, I agree with, with Dale, you know, uh, there might just, I, well, I agree. And I, I'm not sure I agree because they have a lot of, they had a lot of um, interested parties who had put in orders and options. So um, mm -hmm. even though most things can be, or a lot of things can be done over the internet, Zoom meetings, FaceTime calls, um, there's still always going to be some market for people needing to get from point A to point B quickly right? and willing to pay for it. Um, but yeah, Neil, yeah. maybe someone just took off with the money. Who knows? Yeah. Put it in their I, pocket I, I and kind disappeared. Of that feeling too. Like, yeah, what, what happened to all those billions of I have of this dollars, great uh, idea for, an, for a, a new supersonic jet. If you all would uh -huh. like to just, we'll, we'll do it on Kickstarter. Oh, do you? Mm -hmm. Well, you know what, Steph? Funny yeah. you should mention that. Several people now, because... Arion was one of the big companies, you know, along with Boom and uh, another couple uh, developing supersonic uh, aircraft for the future. Um, so that's Arion dropping out has kind of um, uh, made a, a void, created a vacuum in this whole thing. Sure. And uh, so I was able to um, obtain some uh, video of uh, several companies uh, uh, deeply immersing themselves um, and, you know, getting their feet wet in uh, trying to come up with a, a replacement for um, Arion. Here we go. <laughs> so, uh, okay, here are some uh, contenders for the uh, So I always supersonic. wanted to do this. They got rid of this event before I was able to participate or figure out a way to participate. 
No, what are you talking the... about? This is, a, this is an officially sanctioned <laughs> supersonic aircraft. Uh, they're just, as I said, they're, they're testing the waters. <laughs> so, this is the Red Bull uh, Flugtag <laughs> event, correct? I guess. I, People I, make their I own home built gliders and then they just launch them off of this platform to see who can go the farthest and not fall off of the thing. Well, and it usually doesn't go very well, and most of these things right come here apart. Okay. Look, he I don't know, look, he made it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, so Larry, Larry oh. uh, Geezer oh. in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, sent this in to us, and I thought I told Liz, I said I have a perfect place for this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Red Bull, I think, uh, sanctioned this uh, event, and he's, Red he Bull, said they don't do this anymore. They don't do it anymore, as far as I know, yeah. or at least they got rid of it for a while. But Red Bull fluke uh -huh. tag. But it's basically a build your own glider craft and then try to launch it off of a platform and see how far it will go and don't fall uh, off of it in the process or let it fall apart. <laughs> one of these. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, Liz is asking uh, if we invest in your supersonic jet project. Yes. Yes. Do we get a free copy of your album? Um, yeah, I can guarantee that. Okay. You'll never see your money again, though. <laughs> <laughs> or an airplane. Or, or an album. <laughs> or an album. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anyway, well, there you go. That was a little fun. I know. Uh, sorry, uh, Arion. Uh, I didn't mean for it to be at your expense, but um, yeah, we did. Yeah. Um, so we'll keep our, uh, eyes and ears open to find out what happens, uh, with this whole Ariane supersonic thing. Hopefully, uh, they'll be able to recover from it and, and, you know, move forward. But I don't know. I was actually kind of surprised that, you know, that many, that these companies were investing so much money in it because I was just thinking, I don't know if this is a good investment or not. But anyway, ah, that's neither here nor there. Um, let's continue with our last item in the news, and this one is from CNBC.com. Virgin Galactic completes their first space flight in over two years in a step toward finishing development. Virgin Galactic um, is de uh, developing a space tourism system, and they uh, successfully flew its as I just mentioned, their first safe, uh, space flight in more than two years. The company's spacecraft named VSS Unity was carried up to an altitude of about 44,000 feet by a carrier aircraft called VMS Eve. The aircraft then released the aircraft, which fired its rocket engine and accelerated to more than three times the speed of sound. After performing a slow backflip in microgravity at the edge of space, reaching an altitude of 89.2 kilometers, or about 293,000 feet. Unity returned through the atmosphere in a glide. The spacecraft landed back at the runway of Spaceport America in New Mexico that it took off from earlier. By the way, uh, I looked at it, I was like, where is that exactly? It's um, If you're familiar with New Mexico or Interstate 10, you'll remember seeing signs for Las Cruces, uh, uh -huh. And perhaps uh, Truth or Consequences, which is <clears throat> yep. an unusually named town in New Mexico. Uh, apparently a named for the radio show, Truth or Consequences. Um, and it's just a little bit to the west of White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. And uh, so they built a, uh, how many square feet? Uh, big. Um, 800,000, 80,000 square mile. I don't know. Anyway, a big spaceport area complex, yes. Um, okay, so continuing on with the article, uh, it was flawless, Virgin Galactic CEO Michael Colglazier told CNBC ab about the flight. Pilots CJ Sturkow and David Mackey flew Unity. The pair have previously flown to space, as well as fellow Virgin Galactic pilots Michael Such Masucci, and Mark Stuckey and Chief Astronaut Trainer Beth Moses, who have each been given astronaut wings after the company's first two spaceflights. 
the U.S. officially consider pilots who have flown above 80 kilometers to be astronauts. Huh. Uh, let's see, the aircraft is supposed to hold up to six passengers along with two pilots. The company has about 600 reservations for tickets on future flights sold at prices between $200,000 and $250,000 each. Coffee fun. Uh, the space flight. You're going to spring for us to go on a <laughs> space flight, Jeff? That's very oh, yeah. nice of you. Very generous. All of us. Sure. Excellent. <laughs> I mean, hold six, so we could all go together. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Right? Mm -hmm. We we'll just rent the whole darn thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Liz is mentioning that it would be a, a security risk for all of us to fly in the same vehicle at the same time. Ah. Is what if something? <laughs> Uh, anyway, um, Virgin Galactic founder Sir Richard Branson was a, was personally in attendance at the spaceport to watch the flight. Watching alongside him was former New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson, who helped establish the $218.5 million Spaceport America as the company's base of operations and current governor, uh, Luan Lujan. Um, how do you pronounce his first name? Lujan? Luan Grisham? No idea. Luan? Lujan? Okay. I don't know. Luan? Lujan? Yeah. Yeah, no, no. Uh, Governor Grisham. <laughs> there you go. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so anyway, the rest of the article will be in the show notes if you want to read up on this. Um, but um, some interesting photos, and there may actually be video uh, embedded in this particular article. I don't know. I can't tell right now. But uh, you can see definitely in one of these photos that... Uh, it says, VSS Unity floats in microgravity at the edge of space during its third space flight on May 22nd, 2021. And you can clearly see the, uh, the darkness of space and the slight curvature of the Earth. Of course, if you're a flat earther, you're thinking these are all made up and photoshopped. But looks like the real deal to me. Yep. Um, right. And to keep us above 50%, it's Michelle Lujan Grisham. It's two oh. last names. I'm well, not then, sure how you pronounce that Lujan portion. Well, uh, this article didn't say Michelle at all in here. Nope. Just said Governor Lujan well, cause Grisham. Well, because she uses both uh, names uh, as her last name. Oh, that's her last name. Yeah. Ah, uh, gotcha. Well, there's no yep. hyphen there. No. Nope. How am I supposed to know that? I'm not from New Mexico. Nope. Governor... Swivy Java. <laughs> okay, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> yeah, quickly, to... quickly. Yes, quickly, very quickly. It's a getting to know us segment where Yay. we get all caught up on what has been happening with all of us, in this case, just two of us, <laughs> since, or three. Well, we've got and some we stuff from Nick. Liz. Yeah. And Liz. Oh, we do have, yeah, so Liz. We'll, uh, we'll know a little Nick bit about well. what Nick's been up to and why he's not here. Well, we're not going to find out what Rick is doing because we've just learned from the control room that uh, he is not going to be able to join us today. Wow. So. He has promised audio, though, oh. about the... Uh, oh, my God. Oh, okay. What He's going to be sending the... us in some... Okay, we'll have to block, the... uh, what, half an hour to 45 minutes? Flap synchro wire show? failure. <laughs> this... uh, yes. <laughs> the flap synchro. A good, a solid 45 wire. minutes, I think, for him yeah, to... Yeah, yeah. Talk to us about that in <laughs> It detail. may have been a mistake for me to ask him to look into that. <laughs> yeah, it will be the title of the show. All right. Well, we're sorry to hear that, uh, Rick, if you're listening, um, you know, that you're not going to be able to, to join us. And uh, anyway, that's okay. Steph and I are having fun anyway. And Liz is, yes. as well. Okay. So, um, Steph... So let's see, mm -hmm. on um, Monday of this week, we're recording on Thursday the 27th, mm -hmm. and on um, Monday mm -hmm. the 24th, right? Mm -hmm. um, Monday was the 24th, today there was, was the 27th. There was, there was, there was a big, it was a big uh, deal, let's see, uh, I mean, you know, you're not supposed to mention how old people are, especially women, but I think you're what, 47? Is that right? You're At least, birthday? feels like it, I don't know. <laughs> Right now, you probably do feel like it. Right no, now, I do. I'm uh, so congested. I'm not going to say um, she's she's much younger than that. I'm not that much younger. Not even in her 40s. Not that much well, younger. Well, a little bit. <laughs> I don't care. I'll, I'll say it. Uh, well, um, well, we'll just say that 1982 was a good year, and you do the math. There you go. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, did you do anything fun? Um, spent time with family actually. Um, so that oh. was really nice. Um, so my significant other was in town and my brother was in town and his significant other was also in town and my dad is here. So, um, we spent a little bit of time out on the lake. Uh, summer has most definitely arrived here in South Kekalaki. I think the water temperature was like 85 degrees already. So it was wow. nice just to hang out in the water. Um, actually my neighbor came out as well. We chatted for a while and then we all went out to dinner and played some top golf. So not bad for a Monday. Nice. I mean, I had to work a yeah. little bit in the morning, but I definitely did not overtax myself that day. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, work had a nice little barbecue lunch for me as well, which was very thoughtful mm. of them. Much appreciated. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a nice day despite the horrible allergy issues I'm currently dealing with and have been dealing with for about a week now. So if anyone knows what it is that is floating in the air in the southeastern United States and making me miserable, um, Pollen. tell me, but yeah, I, sure. it probably doesn't make any difference. I still suffer from it, um, suffer yeah. with it, suffer through it. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but it was bad enough that I was not able to fly on Sunday or on Saturday, excuse me, Um Kind of started end of last week, scratchy throat from post-nasal drip, very sneezy, itchy, watery eyes, all of that good stuff. Um, and NyQuil. Then kind of just, what's that? NyQuil. NyQuil. Yeah. NyQuil. <laughs> just an ad for all of the medications. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah and uh, you can hear it now still. I can hear it in my voice. I'm sure y'all hear it too. My voice is just, uh, it's, you know, you get that post-nasal mm-hmm. drip and your voice kind of disappears on you. Ammonia vapor. I'm not sure, Arnie, that that's a recommended treatment for <laughs> allergies. <laughs> you got to be careful because if you inhale too much of that, I think it'll kill you. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. It's a fine line between therapeutic and dead. <laughs> fine line. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was not able to fly on Saturday, which was kind of a bummer because the weather was gorgeous here and I was really looking forward to flying all weekend before my birthday. That's kind of a nice birthday gift for me. Um, but I, I rode along on, on the first flight of the day and actually I rode along on two flights. The first flight seemed like it was going to be okay. I was like, oh, okay. Actually, you know, kind of stuffy, but that was fine. No issues. Second flight. Nope. Definitely wasn't going to happen. Lots of sinus pressure. I said, yeah, no, I got to get out mm-hmm. now. And, um, they had to unfortunately call in yeah. one of the, the other pilots cause we needed two aircraft that day. And I mostly spent that day living on, um, all kinds of, decongestants and nasal sprays and allergy medications and throat lozenges and ibuprofen trying to decrease any inflammation associated with it and all kinds of good stuff Mm -hmm. went through like two boxes of kleenex or something i'm not sure um but also ran around and just helped out ground crew stuff um that um at the drop zone so that was kind of fun different side of the operation worked in the uh manifest office and helped them out a little bit or got in their way a little bit i'm not sure which probably both. Um, and fortunately the medicines that I took on Saturday were helpful enough that I was able to fly on Sunday. Um, and since then it's mostly been nuisance of a lot of sinus drainage and, you know, losing my voice and stuff. (laughs) Yeah. It's, I, I I keep telling people at work, I'm like, uh, you know, it's kind of a good thing. We're all still wearing masks, um, in a healthcare setting because I can kind of hide some of that behind my my mask all the snot and coming out of your all the nose. snot I'm like i feel like i feel like a little you know the little kid like that's just like got you know green things coming out of there yeah oh great it's not it's not it's not that bad i promise that's it's not a good picture no you're it's leaving not. us with yeah. yeah especially if you're listening to the audio only now you <laughs> yeah have a really good uh image of me in your mind yeah we're uh, we're seeing her on video right now and as far as we can tell there's none of that no there's really <laughs> not there's really not it's it's mostly okay um, yeah, that's ah, just annoying more than anything, but no birthday mm-hmm. was great. I appreciate all the bir- birthday wishes from, from everyone. Um, it was very kind. I got one more year until a birthday ending in a zero. Uh, yeah. dun, dun, dun. That's all right. It's just a, just a number. Yeah. Just a number. And yeah. I actually, I've got friends coming to town this weekend. A couple of my girlfriends, um, we've known each other for 30 years. Um, <laughs> and yeah you know, a while. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited to have them out here because, um, at least one of them has not visited out here before and none of them have all been, we haven't had everyone here together all at the same time before. So should be a little bit cooler this weekend. Nice weather for hanging out on, uh, on the water. Girls gone wild. 
Girls Weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope you have a great time. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Yeah. Okay. Um, How about you, Jeff? What have you been up to? Me? Well, or should we talk? Uh, to, just got, or should we see what Nick's been up to first? Well, we we could do that. Um, okay. Well, let's, let's talk. Let's talk about me. Yeah, we? you're here. This is one you're of my here. favorite subjects. You <laughs> you um, made the effort to be here today. Let's talk about you. Yeah, first. I did. I made the effort to be here. Uh, let's see. I just got back from a four day trip this morning. Uh, left on Monday, and uh, I, I managed to. Uh, my timing was great. I evaded uh, severe weather again. I think the entire month I've been really. We're lucky as far as timing mm. is concerned, getting, uh, you know, staying away from the, the nasty stuff. And uh, the, the closest got to it, uh, we got to it on this trip was uh, yesterday heading up toward Rochester, New York uh, from Atlanta. And uh, the there was some thunderstorm activity, but it kind of just moved from west to east, as things do here in the northern hemisphere and uh, North America. And uh, kind of moved through Rochester and then out of the way. And then we just kind of went right down that little alley all the way up and had to do just minor deviations here and there, but it wasn't bad at all, and it was actually quite nice in, in Rochester, New York. First night was in Oklahoma City again, and then we were up in Bradley, which is Windsor Locks, Connecticut, and uh, we lay over in Hartford, and that was nice. And I uh, found an, a nice little restaurant that uh, I ventured out a little bit further than uh, my previous layovers there in Hartford, and found a really nice little place called Trumbull Kitchen, I think, and it was a really, really nice bar slash restaurant with um, really good food anyway so that was my trip and uh, let's see memorial day weekend here in the united states uh, this upcoming weekend Uh, by the time you're listening to the uh, podcast it will probably be memorial day or right after memorial day because i'm probably not going to get this thing published until monday night at the earliest because uh, the uh, media server that we use for uh, hosting these big giant three hour files. Uh, I've run out of room. I have, I don't have enough room <laughs> to put another episode in. So I have to wait until the, the June, Oops. uh, time frame starts. So, uh, I'll have plenty of days to, uh, do all the editing and everything else. So that's what I look for it Monday night. That's what I'm hoping to get it out there. And, um, uh, let's see. Um, I leave on Wednesday for a, three-day trip and uh, have layovers in Dallas and Savannah. And that's kind of it for me. Nothing else new. Uh, Still singing on the weekends at uh, uh, several masses every weekend. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, really enjoying that. And yeah, that's about all. So as Steph mentioned, uh, we also have some updates on nick and what he's been doing and why he's not here and so we'll let him explain all that in this audio feedback from him so let's see here take it away nick hi there jeff hi crew Uh, it's captain nick here just a little piece for um our section on uh, getting to know you uh i'm not available i'm afraid this week I'm down in a place called Trebarwith. So it's a tiny little cove in Cornwall. Uh, It's the bottom left-hand corner of England, the bit that sticks out into the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, it's it's a delightful area. It's full of rocky coastline and, um, you know, fabulous sea. it's a kind of good um, surfing spot. And normally we love being down here because uh, we can sit on the beach, enjoy the sunshine, etc. But sadly, um, at the moment, we're having an unseasonably cold and wet uh, month of May. So we're da- down here on in a prime spot. We've uh, moved into a tiny little um, seaside uh, old cottage and it's the last cottage in the row before you actually get to the bay and uh, we have an, an, a lovely view of the ocean it's a very narrow little cove but very pretty and just beyond this big old rock that sticks out of the sea called gull rock 
uh, I guess because uh, they couldn't think of a better name and it was covered in gulls. Um, but uh, sadly the weather has been uh, less than perfect. Doesn't matter to us. Uh, the weather's, uh, if the weather's bad, you just need to dress appropriately. And I have to say right now, looking out of these uh, great big rollers that are crashing in across uh, the Atlantic, the sea is the most fabulous green color covered in uh, white foam. Uh, and uh, there's been, you know, huge accumulations of, uh, of foam on the beach and uh, even up the street past our uh, little uh, cottage we've uh, rented here. So it's uh, the most sun stunning spot, very little internet. So, uh, you know, we haven't done much except to enjoy walks around, uh, done fun things with the dogs. And uh, I think tomorrow we'll probably, when the rain eases, go and see Tintagel Castle and have a look around there. Another fantastic spot uh, steeped in the memories of uh, the fable of King Arthur. So that's really us. Anyway, just thought I'd catch up with you. Hope you have a great show. Hope everyone's uh, fit and well. Happy birthday to Steph. And uh, look after yourselves. Cheers. Well, cheers. And uh, it looks like um, you, your camera came in handy. Oh, my camera's broken. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had like um, uh, my my laughter started a little too soon because I knew it was clip was going to be played there. You can play it again. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's in the um, overlays. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no problem. Hey, no problem. I didn't I didn't mention that to you before we uh, started the show. So um, there we go. Um, great uh, update from Nick uh, and his wonderful vacation getaway holiday in. Uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce the name of the place that he said he was, but it's in Cornwall. <laughs> I can. Oh, Neil was there last year. Lovely place, he says. I mean, All it right. looks like it from the the pictures. Shame it was kind of yeah. rainy and cool, but, um, you know, I'm sure they found plenty of things to do to keep themselves occupied and enjoy the yeah. holiday getaway. Absolutely. All right. Well, we look forward to uh, hearing more about it, uh, Nick, on next week's show, whenever that is. We're not sure yet, but uh, as soon as we know, we'll put it on the APG community calendar, and then you'll know as well. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's continue with uh, your way to support the show financially, if you so desire. And we do that with uh, Jeff Smith singing for us the uh, APG Java Jive. Johnny, how much more coffee? Sure thing. I love coffee. I love tea. I love the APG community. Coffee and tea and the Java and me. A cup, a cup, a cup, a cup, a cup. Oh, yeah. All right. As I mentioned, Coffee Fund is your way to support our show financially. And several of you out there do, and we do appreciate you. And the rest of you, you're just a bunch of freeloaders. Just send your cash. Just send your cash. All right. I don't mean to make you feel bad, but yeah. So, all right. Let's talk about two different ways to uh, join the Coffee Fund. Uh, that is the Coffee Fund Classic Method. And since the last episode... Vigner Ornwanison uh, sent us his recurring uh, con Gunnison? contribution. Gunnison? And Gun that's, Gunnison? That's Gunnison? That's Icelandic, isn't it? I don't know. Yeah, you think so? Let us, I don't yeah. know. That, that I've asked him to send us some feedback and let us know kind of a how, to, how to say sound, that. sound, I think. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, and uh, we uh, have a new contributor, uh, Jose Sujo. 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 Uh, thank you very much, Jose. And uh, that's one way to do it. And the other way is to become a patron of the show via Patreon. And we have a new producer, Platelet Films. And we have an executive producer, a new one, Austin Blake. Thank you guys for joining the Coffee Fun Cadre and becoming patrons of our show. So if you want to get off your duff and feel less guilty, uh, head over to airlinepilotguy.com slash coffee. 
and you'll have information there on how you can join this wonderful group of people. And now, time for feedback. Captain, incoming message. And this is when I say, Steph, do you need to take a break? I kind of do. Okay. Me too. I'll I be kind of need to. Quick about take it. a little break, physiological okay. break. Um, Chat room, and, entertain uh, yourselves. Yes, because uh, I guess we could do this. We can put uh, some some background this. music on for them. I, well, it's intermission. Go grab I, your raisinets and your yeah. Just imagine that refresh. music is playing because I'm afraid that if I play something, it's going to be something that Google objects to and ah. thinks I'm violating copyright. So, oh. Oh, there we go. What um, is that? <laughs> oh, it's my it's that's my work phone. I was like, my phone is on. Hey, silent. What is that? <laughs> uh, I don't even know where it is. It's like in the corner over there. So um, okay. you can listen to that. Hopefully that's not copyrighted by yeah, Apple. That's pretty. Right. I hope not. OK, we'll be right back. <laughs> I'm going to mute it, though. All right. So I had a little issue. I, I tried to use the uh, the restroom uh, down here in the studio level of the uh, headquarters building, and um, I kind of bumped into to somebody. Would you let me finish a poo for once? <laughs> That's awkward. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's ready, though. I mean, hopefully you will be ready for... He's. I feel like he's still going to be... You're going to be interrupting him still, though. I was well, going to be in the middle of I, I, business. <laughs> I don't know. I'm always interrupting him, but we do appreciate the fact that he sticks with the whole the whole show thing. Oh, yeah. Anyway. All right. You ready? Ready. Let's dive in. Let's dive in to the feedback. Let's start with this from Captain Peter. Um. Oh, he sent some uh, crazy pictures. Uh, let's see if I can uh, show them to you while I'm reading his uh, feedback. Hang on. Okay, that's weird. And uh, da, da, da. there. That's one of his uh, pictures while I read. Um. If I may follow on from Captain Nigel's feedback in episode 470 regarding Cathay Pacific's Canadian base closure, it has now been announced that the Frankfurt base is to close immediately as well. This adds to the consultation regarding the Australian and New Zealand bases, which is a requirement under their labor laws, and the painted picture is not pretty. This leaves only the U.S. and London bases, which are up for review as well. 
With the pay being much higher at present on the base after the over 50% permanent pay cut for Hong Kong-based crew, I feel the writing is on the wall. Asian aviation, apart from China domestic, is very is a very sick beast indeed. China Airlines and Taiwan have announced a two-week quarantine for all their pilots. The bubble flights from Singapore to Hong Kong will be abandoned for the second time. Spikes in infection for the rest, where zero COVID has been the government's aim, is shutting everything down again. My employer, Acme East, uh, excuse me, I think I'm going through puberty, uh, Acme East is offering an early retirement, which I am seriously considering, as I cannot foresee any improvement in this part of the world for a very long time. I've not been able to go home now for 15 months. Wow. And at some stage, this becomes untenable. It's a very difficult decision, as I, like you, still love doing what I do. However, the ongoing restrictions are taking so much enjoyment out of the job. It's a crazy world we live in, some parts more than others. Always the blue side up. Now, so I think he was probably uh, trying to illustrate confusion and craziness in these pictures. But to me, it looks like this way everything looks to me in the cockpit when I have those early morning get-ups. You know, just nothing really looks quite right. Uh, mm. Trying to read <laughs> that ACAR screen. That's how your ACARs looks to you. You're like, <laughs> yeah, and I go, uh, what is that? <laughs> where are we going? Where's our... Yeah. Fuel. So uh, yeah. there you go. Um, yeah, Peter, you're, you're right. It's definitely a crazy world. And there's a lot of parts of the world that are still quite crazy for one reason or another. Some places it's COVID related still and others it's, uh, you know, um, I don't know, just refer to the news uh, item about Belarus. Uh, uh, yeah, lots of crazy things always, sure. but. Hopefully, I mean, I, I think everyone wants these situations to, to turn around as quickly as possible, but that's going to be obviously very dependent on what individual governments decide to do with some of these restrictions and loosening of of those things. And um, in terms of how the situation is with COVID, you know. And as far as, you know, people getting along with other people, can't we just come on, let's just love each other. Well, that Seriously. Too. Yeah. You yeah. know, that's what the world needs, right? Mm -hmm. Love, sweet love. And it, it's it's really terrible when yep. stuff like this takes the enjoyment out of the job. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. you, you do the job because you love it, but when it becomes a chore and a hassle and yeah. not able to get home for fifteen months, that's not that's not ideal. Yeah, that's that's horrible. That's horrible. Yeah. So I, I mean, I can't even you, imagine that to be honest. No. So Captain Peter, hang in there. If you do end up, Definitely. let us know what you're, what you're gonna do as as far as retiring early or what you know. All right. Well, thank you for yeah. sending in that update feedback. Um, continuing on, um, this is from Darren. Now you'll remember that Darren is the one that makes these models. Um, I, I love this feedback. Actually, this is one of my favorites recently. <laughs> So he says, I know this isn't specifically aviation related, but since it flies in the sky and will probably show up on an ATC radar screen, <laughs> what is he talking about? Um, here, let me kind of do this here and uh, show you what he's been up to. Um, I thought I'd share it with you all. I just completed this 170 scale Saturn Five model rocket which does fly it stands five feet five inches tall and will reach an altitude of about 500 feet when I launch it I'll be sure to send a video loving the podcast Darren Nolan yeah he you know he was the one that uh, did the beautiful work on the uh, I think the F4 Phantom yeah yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and some other very realistic uh, beautiful looking uh, models right. and nice pictures of them too like it was very uh just artistic the way he had everything set up. Mm -hmm. And then, so I, I wrote back to him and said, that's so cool, Darren. I dabbled in modern model rocketry when I was in my teens, but I never launched anything so beautiful as that. In fact, I never, it was always a stuff from, what was it called? Uh, the name of the com company. Uh, can't remember it now. If it's on the tip of my tongue. Anyway. Um, and uh, it was just like the stuff that, no, not Ronco. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, Estes, I think. E-S-T-E-S. -E I don't know. Maybe I'll look at the comments of the live chat. I bet somebody has already kind of hinted that for me. Nope, not yet. Of course, they're a little bit behind as far as the time is concerned. Anyway, um, but uh, so I, I said, um, are you sure you want to launch that thing? Won't there be a chance of damage? Thanks for sharing. Brings back memories of my dad, and this is me speaking here to uh, Darren. He worked for North American Aviation in the 60s and early 70s and had something to do with the Saturn V second stage, uh, the S-2. It was assembled in Seal Beach, California. Good. Uh, just right down the road from where I grew up in Los Alamitos. Uh, Liz just said that I was correct about Estes. Um, anyway, as usual, you did a beautiful job. And then he says, uh, wow, that's so cool that your dad worked on the legendary Saturn V. I've probably watched over, oh, by the way, uh, if you're just listening uh, and you're not looking at the show notes, that's the model uh, that he has just con uh, finished uh, creating and building, a Saturn V uh, rocket. Um, he said, uh, I've probably watched over 1,000 videos of it blasting off, and every single time I get goosebumps watching it slowly lift off with the USA and American flag decal showing through all the falling ice and vapor. You would be correct in wondering if I'm concerned about it being damaged during a launch. You see, last year I built another Saturn V that was about half the size of this one, and I'd put at least 20 to 30 hours of work into building it pictures attached okay so let's go to the next picture here okay there we go that was the one that he built previously and uh, let's see on its maiden flight in front of about 20 friends and family it got stuck on the launch pad with the rocket motor firing away it melted oh, the entire lower section and even burned a hole through the metal base plate of the launch pad um here, let me see. I think we have some photos of that. Okay, he's um, holding the uh, remains of the Saturn V rocket, uh, giving us a thumbs down. And the bottom end of it is looks a little melty. Yeah, a little crispy. A little yeah. crispy. Yeah, a uh, little there we go. Destroyed. Uh, yeah, destroyed. And then here's the launch pad, I believe. Uh, the Ooh. hole that was burnt through the launch pad. You through can see the blast the plate. Yep. heat of those little rocket engines. Uh, while I did figure out the reason for it getting stuck and I fixed it, it would be a travesty for this new model rocket to end in a similar fashion. Yeah, I'm thinking about the part where it goes up and then, you know, the, like the parachute doesn't come out <laughs> or something. You know, that's, that's what I'd be worried about. There's a lot of considerations here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So when are you launching it, Darren? Let us know. Yeah, I think he'll probably send us some I think he probably some, will. Uh, <laughs> some photos. You better. Darren, you got a or a video. I think he said he'll he'll send hopefully as well. So there we go. Thank you, Darren, for keeping us up to date. And again, wow, um, I just don't have the patience to do something like like that that you're doing. It's amazing. Very cool though. And then launch it. Yeah, bravery and courage. Well, you know that's the reward. You get to see it either uh, launch in all of its spectacular glory or burn up in a fiery wreck on the ground. <laughs> Yeah, that's Either what way. would happen if I did it. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, we received some audio feedback from Mike. Uh, he says, hi, APG crew. My family and I were recently traveling in Colombia, where we had to take a half dozen flights to get around the country. Even though we spoke very little Spanish, we got around surprisingly well, and all the flights were on time with no weather or mechanical delays. It wasn't until we returned to Atlanta that things went haywire. Rather than write it all down, I recorded the story for you. Note that the squall that came through Atlanta initially, you know, we talked about the, uh, we heard the recordings of the, uh, the air traffic control tower, uh, north and south towers in Atlanta and the flights and everything else when this happened. Uh, yeah, they evacuated the uh, tower. He said, um, initially, um, Let's see, the squall came through, initially had winds that I estimated to be around 70 knots. So that was probably what the control tower w was reacting to. After that, the winds were better and there was still lightning all around us. Things settled down, but that initial squall was very impressive indeed. Blue Skies, Mike Smith uh, from Maynard, Mass. And now we're going to listen to his audio. Yeah, where are you? 
Okay, here we go. Hi, APG crew. This is Mike Smith, the Sonics guy from Maynard, Massachusetts. My family and I were recently traveling in Colombia, South America, where we had to make a lot of flights to get between the various cities that we were visiting. On the way back, we were flying Acme Airlines and got to Atlanta. That's where things went to hell in a handbasket. Through no fault of the airline, it was just the weather. We had gotten a five minute boarding call in the gate area and just about three minutes later, the most intense squall I've ever seen came through. The wind was horizontal, the rain was horizontal, you couldn't see one inch out the window, and then the hail started coming down. Lightning, it was, it was intense. It was far more winds than what we were hearing on the ATC recording on APG episode 470. Uh, I would estimate that the winds were at least 70 knots. So after all of that sort of passed, there was still lightning in the area, there was still weather, but the worst of it had gone. So they, they boarded us, and uh, as we were sitting down, the captain said that they needed to do a hail check because of the hail. And so we sat there and we were waiting for the, uh, the crews to come out and do that. And about 30 minutes later, uh, the captain told us that, uh, that the hail check they needed to do was actually gonna be about a two hour check well, we weren't going to sit in the airplane for two hours, so they got us out of the airplane, sent us down to another gate in the same terminal, and had us wait. And about two hours later, uh, they were able to board us onto the next airplane after they moved our luggage over. So we sat on the airplane, and the weather was still in the area. Uh, certainly not intense anymore, but there was definitely weather in the area. So we got on the airplane. Uh, waited for a while. Finally, uh, we were able to taxi out. We taxied out. We held. We held. We held. Then the captain started telling us that uh, he and his first officer were going to be timing out in about a half an hour, but they hoped that we'd get out before that. So we waited, and we waited, and after 30 minutes, the captain came back and said, uh, folks, I'm sorry to tell you, but uh, we've timed out. Uh, we can't uh, fly, and so we've got to take the airplane back to the gate. However, there are no gates available right now because everybody else is stranded as well. So we hung out in the line, in the conga line, until they finally got a gate for us. Uh, we taxied towards the gate. We got near the gate. Captain called and said, we're sorry, but the gate we were going to is actually full, and we have to go to another gate. So we taxied over to another gate. We got there. We deplaned. They told us at that point that the flight was canceled, and there was, of course, the mad rush for everybody heading towards the uh, the uh, help uh, desk to find out if we could book another flight, get a hotel, whatever. It was 11 o'clock at night, or after 11 uh, by this time. So we got to the counter, and uh, as we were waiting in line, they announced to everybody that there were no more hotels available. So uh, we started you know, getting on our phones and seeing if we could find something. There wasn't anything literally within 40 miles of the airport available for, uh, for a hotel. Finally got up to the counter and they were trying to help us book another flight. Now this is a Saturday. They said the, the next flight out that we could get to Boston was Tuesday. So we started asking for options. We said, maybe we can go to Philadelphia and then we'll drive our, you know, get a rental car and drive back. Uh, nothing available uh, until Monday. So we said, how about LaGuardia or one of the other uh, New York airports? They said, again, nothing until Monday. So they tentatively booked us on another flight um, and we said, all right, thank you very much. Uh, we went uh, at that point to try to check on our luggage. Uh, I wanted to see if we could get our luggage because, uh, you know, if the flight was canceled, where's the luggage going? So we went down to luggage. We waited in the luggage line for close to an hour. And when we got up there and explained to them what we were looking for, they said, oh, well, your flight hasn't been canceled. It's going to leave in the morning. So as long as you're going to go with it, you know, your, your luggage is going to stay on board. You're like, oh, okay, well, according to the <laughs> what we were told, the flight was canceled. So at that point, uh, 
we were stuck at the airport. There was no, there were no hotels anywhere to be had. And uh, we were going to spend the night in the airport, my, my uh, daughter, my wife, and I. So we started looking around, and at, by this time, it's uh, two, yeah, it's about two o'clock in the morning. And uh, luckily, there was a Burger King that decided to stay open, and they, they stayed open until about 2.30. So we got in line with a lot of other people, got some food, put our heads down on the table, and tried to get some, some sleep. That didn't work too well, so we spent an uncomfortable night in the uh, airport, but, you know, that's that's the way things go. So our flight was scheduled for uh, 11 a.m. Uh, the next day. So we got uh, to the gate, you know, well ahead of time, we got up there, verified that, you know, the flight was still going, that we were still on it. And uh, come about 11 o'clock, they said, uh, you know, we're, we're actually having uh, trouble with this airplane. Uh, I think we're going to have to put you on another airplane. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to send you to, over to a totally different terminal. So a few people uh, with families turned around and started bolting for the trains to get you over to the other terminal. <laughs> About two minutes later, they came and said, oh, sorry, no, actually, we're going to stay right here and we're going to take this airplane. Sorry for the false alarm. <laughs> of course, there had been people that had already taken off for the other terminal at that point, so we felt bad for them. So we, uh, we, we sat around for a while. They finally boarded us, uh, got on the airplane, and, uh, and finally got on our way somewhere around 2 o'clock uh, in the afternoon. So it was, uh, it was quite, the, quite the adventure. Uh, my 17-year-old daughter had never been through uh, sleeping in an airport before. <laughs> and if she never has to do it again, she'll be uh, quite happy. But uh, I do have to say that the, through the entire event, uh, the captain was was very communicative, uh, very funny as much as he could be. Came out, always told us what was going on, you know, for better or for worse. And the funny thing was, is the captain and the first officer that timed out uh, the night before ended up being the crew that flew us out the next day. They got their FAA uh, rest period in and came back to the airport and they said, hey, you're going to take this flight. So <laughs> it was pretty funny that we were all reunited again. So, you know, stuff happens. But uh, but I did want to tell you that uh, what you were hearing for the winds reported in the tower in that recording of something like 45 knots gusting, that's not what came through originally. What came through originally was far more intense than that. And then after that, there was still lightning in the area. And that's why we, you know, we all sat in the conga line and couldn't take off. So... Anyway, just thought I'd relate that story. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, tailwinds and uh, IPAs to everybody. All right. An eyewitness account, an AB, APG community member uh, there that night when that... Yeah, they're everywhere, Liz says. <laughs> so uh, that's awesome. Um, thank you for that uh, firsthand report. And sorry about that. That's just a lousy experience when, you know, there are no hotels to go to and you just got to... You know, I've been there. I've can. been there. Have you? Actually, I'm, I'm thinking of um, one instance in particular. Um, I was trying to I was coming back from Europe. I think I was in Ireland. This was quite a long time ago, back in 2013, 20. No, actually, I was just discussing this with 2011. So 10 years ago, probably. Mm -hmm. And I um, I made it back from Ireland back to the States. I, I had a layover in Philly. And then I had to come from Philly to Charlotte to Greenville, North Carolina. So it was not the most direct routing, but there you have it. It was probably a cheap ticket, and I probably was a student at the time. So, you know, that's how that goes. And uh, got on the plane in Philly, and we pushed back from the gate. And then we sat on the taxiway for um, – that, that was when they just went to the three-hour rule. So uh, for, like, the full three hours because of a ground stop in Charlotte – we went back to the gate, got off the plane, and then we were immediately reboarded and we took off and went to Charlotte. Um, hmm. So, but by this time I had long since missed my connection to Greenville. And mm -hmm. because it was weather related, it was not a uh, something that was going to be compensated by the airline, even though I had nowhere to go for the evening. Um, and there were, it, it was kind of a mess in the airport and there were lines of people everywhere and all the customer service and reservations desks and everything um so i got off the plane kind of assessed that situation i went you know what 
this is well worth whatever money I'm going to spend for a, for a hotel room to not have to spend the night in the airport. And I booked the nearest and um, cheapest and least sketchy hotel that I could find and got some sleep and got myself rebooked on the first flight in the morning through the uh, reservations agent on the phone. So I did not have to wait in one of those lines. Um, oh, that's good. But yeah. But yeah, you got to kind of, you know, think on your feet really quick when that stuff happens so that you don't get mm -hmm. stuck in the quagmire of stuff. Long I think that, and uh, angry, some... angry passengers and angry you know, reservation or gate agents and things. And you know, it's beyond their control a little bit. And they're just trying to deal with everything going on. This is something that I don't really have to deal with. Usually um, when I travel, I'm usually traveling non-revenue. And so I don't have any protections at all. Um, what little there might be. But I've heard that when a situation happens and the flight's canceled or whatever, and everybody you know lines up in front of the um, whatever airline counter it is, that you're usually better off to call, call. one of the 800 numbers or if you have an app. Uh, so you can... now, uh, you know, this was not the case back then, but now everything can be done through the app. And a lot of times you actually mm -hmm. will get a, um, the airline that I fly most often here out of Charlotte, um, they'll actually have a suggestion for what to do next on the mm -hmm. app. You know, it's like, oh, your flight was canceled or delayed. You know, you have this option or this option or call us. Yeah. And that's so much easier and probably a lot faster than waiting in one of those long, long lines mm -hmm. and yep, standing absolutely. around people that are very frustrated and unhappy. Yeah. Uh, no one so. no one needs that kind of uh, frustration no. to rub off of them on them in their lives. No, just no. But no, thanks for the uh, the feedback, Mike. Yeah, Mike. Interesting to hear. Good to hear from you. Um, let's continue with um, Moshe. He said, uh, after close to two decades at Acme Israel, I started a new job and a new phase of my career last week. I have abandoned the faltering airline industry in favor of the unmanned aviation world and am now working at a company that's making drone delivery a reality. The future is here. Uh, my question is this, now that I'm no longer in the airline industry, what do I need to do in order to maintain qualification as an APG listener and qualified community member? I found a bootleg copy of the APG training manual online, but I didn't see anything about recurrent and ongoing qualification for listeners who have left the airline industry of their own free will. I hope there is still room in the community for a defector like me. Keep the drones below, Moshe from... Israel. Now, I don't know about you, Steph, but I'm thinking mm. we usually call a special. I was going to say we we need to have a special meeting about this. Um, yeah. To discuss and see if we'll make an exception, because um, it's definitely something that requires an exception. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I mean, he's no. he's asked. He has sent us nice feedback, and he's asked permission to to stay. Yeah, that's. Yeah. He's, he's got a couple of points going for him right there, mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. uh, Liz says something about uh, put him through the APG simulator. I'm not sure exactly. What, what do you mean uh, exactly, Liz? A very difficult weekend of tests that we put you through. Oh, yeah. Well, that seems kind of extreme. Uh, a little harsh. Um, I, you know, let's, let's have a, uh, we'll have a meeting and we'll, and we'll try to figure this out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an executive mm -hmm. meeting. But I think you're going to be okay, though, Marcia. We accept yeah. payment in IPAs or bribes in IPAs. Oh. I mean, you know. Um, good, good. Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, Liz Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How much is one Bitcoin now? Like, I think the last one was like something just shy of $40,000. Don't even know. Yeah, it dropped Ridiculous. down quite a bit. But I think it's up to last Last I heard was uh, 38000 or something like Jeez. that. So who knows? Yeah. Ridiculous. So, yeah, one Bitcoin would do it. <laughs> If, you know, we'll we'll keep yeah, you in the great. community for that. <laughs> yeah, we'll keep you there. All right, thank you, Bonjour. Um Let's see. Oh, we have some some audio, actually video feedback um, that we can play here, and this is an interesting one. Uh, I think we'll have a good discussion on this one. And let me share the video. And here we go. Open. Bass Aviation, real ATC. Uh, Charlie, you up ground free? Yes, sir, I am. 
Roger, yeah, you're not supposed to go that way. That's golf. You're supposed to go in on Julia. You can't go that way. Can you come back to the intersection here and make a 180? Straight ahead, make it, when you get to the uh, Y there, make a 180 back and taxi back out, golf, Alpha, and Julia. Okay, uh, my partner in back says that we need to go to uh, Gulf Coast, so are we going the right, right way for the Gulf Coast? You're going to Gulf Coast, you just got to tell us what you're doing so we know where you're going. Taxi straight ahead on Gulf. Yeah, that's obvious. I need to tell you where I'm going. I wasn't quite sure if you could understand that. 95 Charlie. Roger. Yeah, before you, just before you start taxiing, let, us, let the other guy know when he taxis you and say, hey, I need to go somewhere different. Of course. I, of course I understand that. I, don't lecture me. Do what you're supposed to do then, sir. Hey, don't get smiled either. Do what you're supposed to do. Ma'am, I'm stopping you from going where you're not supposed to go initially. Thank you. No thank you. There's no thank you there. You're just being a wise guy. Just doing my job, sir. You're hilarious. Do me a favor. When you get into the bit parking, uh, I'm going to give you a phone number to call. I am not calling you. There will be a phone call today. Big deal. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, I have uh, questions. Yeah. Okay. What, what, yeah. I don't know if I'll be able to answer them, but go ahead. Was he confusing golf and golf? Like in terms of where he was trying uh, to go and wasn't. Hmm. I don't, that's not the impression I got. The impression that okay. I got was that he just decided that to go a different way than he had taxi wherever been he wanted to go. go. Yeah. <laughs> and thought, oh, it's just, it's, this airport's not that busy. It was a uh, Lakeland uh, airport um, to the, uh, what, east of uh, Tampa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. Maybe he just thought it wasn't important to tell ground control, control. <laughs> Uh, where he was going, and of course the controller is going like, where, where are you going? Uh, mm -hmm. Let me help you out here. Um, but apparently this gentleman, and I'm using that term very liberally. Sarcastically. Loosely, yeah. <laughs> Sarcastically, yeah, all those. Um, decided that uh, this was some kind of um, an affront or a challenge to his competency or something, I'm sensing. And uh, especially when he says, don't lecture me. Don't you lecture me. <laughs> um, I mean, I yeah, just, I don't. you're hilarious. Yeah. Just doing my job. <laughs> That's hilarious. I don't understand <laughs> anything that was going through this guy's head. I mean, you just, that's not how you behave in this environment ever. No. You just I don't, I don't say know. what you need to say and, and apologize. Well, and if you, I mean, say, hey, yeah, sorry. if you, I mean, even if you think you didn't screw up you go oh okay uh what would you like me to yeah. do we'll take care of that perfect let's get it done right um right this by the way is uh, lakeland ground control that was uh, communicating with him yeah it's just uh, it just makes sense to me a, a rational and logical sense to like you know be as nice as you can apologetic as you can um and you know say i'm sorry for the misunderstanding and what do you need me to do now i'll stop mm -hmm. you know yep that could take care of it Easy. It's so easily been resolved. Instead, this guy just, uh, you know, makes it, um, makes a mountain from a molehill and yeah, got his back up. So. And I'm um, pretty sure there probably was a phone sad. call. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to uh, call I bet it. I bet it didn't go very well either. <laughs> at least not for this, yeah. this guy, this pilot. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they do, they do know. Um, yeah, my main man Micah says sounds like the same kind of guy that would have beat up a flight attendant when told to stay seated during it during taxiing. No kidding. Yeah, that kind of. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, they have all your information. They know mm -hmm. what your N number is, and they know how to get your contact information, and mm -hmm. they figured out what your phone number is, sir. And I'm sure that the FAA had something to say to you. I'm so. sure. Yeah. Uh, anyway, Lidgar, don't don't uh, be says, that guy. Was it a citation? That citation? <laughs> no, this this one November sounded, Romeo. <laughs> yeah. Oh this, no 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 that wasn't a citation. A that was a uh, yeah. yeah that was different. That was a different aircraft entirely. Yeah, I think that Not this from just from the sounds of it, and I might, might be wrong. It sounded like a much older voice, male voice, and and maybe. You know, he just was a little sensitive about people correcting him, you know, and 
So what, do you, what do you say? Are like you know, that, but <laughs> some people are like that, but those people should probably yeah. not be operating aircraft either. Yeah. Well, Micah says to your question, Luger, about whether uh, it was a citation jet. No, but he's going to get a citation of some sort of another or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anyway, so there you have it. Um, the uh, little uh, tense exchange. Keep it pleasant and professional, Liz says. Yes, good idea. Good advice. Um, Robert in Mayretta should know better than to send us a question <laughs> regarding um, UFOs because we have discussed this kind of stuff on previous episodes. I'm trying to find something that would sound like a... Uh, here we go. All right. We'll play that in the background a little bit. Okay. So... I'm sure many of you, all of you probably have seen the uh, or heard about the U.S. Navy pilots that saw some strange things on their on their instruments. Um, and they uh, were on 60 Minutes, um, what, uh, just a couple of weeks ago or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, very um, he says, it appears mainstream news is paying attention to these reports this week. Curious of your thoughts, especially now that the Pentagon has declassified these reports and officially said they can't explain them. So UFOs are regular. This is what the headline here says uh, from what? Uh, CBS News. Uh, UFOs are regularly spotted in restricted U.S. airspace report on the phenomena due next month. And again, from uh, 60 Minutes. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time with this. Uh, Nick and I have mentioned that Neither of us have ever personally seen, um, well, yeah, I've seen things that are, I cannot identify what they are. And they're flying objects, or they seem to be, but I don't think that they're anything from, like, some other world, or, you know, like an alien life form flying these things or whatever. Um, personally, we haven't, and we um, are skeptical uh, about these kind of things, and I think think i'm not sure i did not see this piece on 60 minutes robert um but i think most of the things that they're seeing um the the shapes of the uh, objects and the how quickly they're moving and you know going dropping eighty thousand feet in one second and that kind of thing i think are are happening on like um infrared radar and that kind of thing i don't think that any of these folks have actually seen like visually acquired and and witnessed this kind of stuff going on i i don't know my personal feeling about all this is that there is some kind of technology going on by probably our government that is uh has a capability of of uh putting this kind of uh this kind of uh unidentified thing on people's uh instrumentation and sensors and that kind of thing and i just don't i don't that's just you know feeling. you know what but, i you think know, maybe, what do you think aliens okay well, Steph is in the alien column <laughs> in, so, in many in more ways than meets the eye. That's very true. <laughs> no, actually, I, uh, I don't buy into much of any of this. So. Yeah. Lane says uh, in our live audience, had a bug that I could not identify land on my cocktail. Is that a UFO? Yes. Well, yeah, it mm -hmm. is. <laughs> you have not identified it. Some, someone probably can. <laughs> um, What's that bug doing in my soup later? <laughs> Looks like the backstroke, sir. Yeah. <laughs> but it, Don't worry. I won't drink much. Um, anyway, yeah, again, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not ruling it out. I'm, I, I think that there's a possibility for anything, you know, but I don't know. I just I just find this hard to believe. I really do. And I've seen all the... Yeah, all the videos and heard the communications of the uh, guys and the uh, guys and gals in the in the jets and you know what they're seeing and I would imagine that it would be like whoa what is this or you know tracking and I've never seen anything move like this and it doesn't look like there's any you know physical propulsion coming out of it. I don't you know it just seems to me like somebody's messing with them <laughs> and probably yes. the United States uh, DARPA and all that kind of stuff. Okay. 
Uh, Liz is suggesting that before we move on with uh, some really, really good uh, audio feedback from Captain Al, um, that uh, we uh, go ahead and bid farewell to Stephanie uh, because uh, she needs to she needs to leave. And uh, Unfortunately. I think this would be a good time um, for you to to go. Okay. Uh, no? uh, the audio is or seven minutes. Stay? I can stay through this audio and oh. then I will okay. say my goodbyes She's going after to that. Uh, stay then. She wants to hear uh, Captain Al's wonderful how could I? Voice. How could I miss out on Captain Al's uh, You can't. Feedback. I mean, and I, have you... Have you? Yeah, it's not about chicken nuggets, though. So oh, just well, in that case, I'm leaving. <laughs> okay, but it's it's actually almost as interesting as chicken nuggets. Almost. I look forward to it. Yeah, and let me see where is my. Here we go. I'm trying to find the window that <laughs> plays all my sound clips. There it is. Okay, here we go. Captain Al, take it away, sir. Hello, APG crew. I thought with your permission I'd take a few moments of your valuable time to revisit APG 469, in which my long-lost Estonian cousin Alan talked about the A320 accident. Nick and Jeff did a great job, but if I may I'd like to put a little bit of meat on the bones. The A320 is a 1980s design and the very first fly-by-wire commercial aircraft so the computers are much simpler than that of the A330. To illustrate this point, the navigation database is updated via 3.5 inch floppy disks. That's floppy disks, not a reference to an old pilot with erectile dysfunction. Floppy disks, for those of you who've never experienced dial-up internet or newspaper print on your fingers, are like USB sticks, but much bigger and just as easy to lose. Anyway, I digress. The A320 has seven flight control computers, two ELACs, elevator and aileron computers, three SECs, spoiler and elevator computers, and two FACs. ELAC2 would normally operate the elevators via hydraulic control, and if ELAC2 fails, then ELAC1 takes over. If ELAC1 fails, then SEC2 takes over, and if SEC2 fails, then SEC1 takes over. So as you can see from a computer point of view, there is quite a lot of redundancy. It's the same setup with the trimmable horizontal stabiliser, ELAC2 to 1, and then SEC2 to 1. Now the ELACs and their backup SECs are a history in themselves. Airbus were keen to ensure that reliability was good from day one, so both Intel and Motorola chipsets are used, so as to avoid any issues with processor anomalies. In fact, the ELACs use the Motorola 68010 processor, and the SECs use the Intel 80186 processor. Not even a Pentium, I hear you say. It's true. But... In the 1980s, these weren't the top chips in town, but nonetheless, they were reliable, and that's exactly what was needed. Fuck, I knew I'd forgotten something. Don't worry, it's still a family show. As I mentioned, there are two flight augmentation computers, FACs. Again, not a reference to an old pilot's medical issues, but in simple terms, your damping and rudder travel limiting limiting the travel of the rudder at high speed and thereby keeping the tail attached to the rest of the aircraft. Not a bad idea in my book. Now it's fair to say that the facts do an awful lot more fancy stuff too, like sensing for wind shear and calculating storm speeds, but that's a tale for another day. Now the old plot, not to be confused with an old pilot, was a teensy wincy bit wrong when he said pressing the flight computer push button to off and then back on again was like resetting a circuit breaker. On the 330, and presumably the 340, that is correct. However, the 320 is a slightly different beast, and it's more a matter of hard and soft. No, it's not going to be the same joke again, don't worry. It's a matter of resets. Turning the flight control computer off and on via the push button affects a soft reset, whereas pulling the circuit breaker, conveniently located on the flight deck, 
waiting 20 seconds or so and then pushing it back in performs a hard reset. Now, none of the fancy newfangled computers are any damn good if the metal bits they control can't or don't move as they should. And so we begin the cascading sequence of doom with multiple computer failures that Nick and Jeff described. Now as far as I'm concerned, they nailed the sequence of events, so I'm not going to revisit old ground. But if you will allow me a short moment, I'd like to speculate. Something I'm always wary of, but nonetheless, I'd like to speculate as to why the captain was routinely resetting the computers. This was, as you will recall, a training flight, where pilots are practicing landing the aircraft. While simulators are very good, they cannot process all of the variables that go into the last few feet of a flight. So typically, pilots who've not flown passenger transport aircraft previously have to make a series of practice landings in a real aircraft. As Nick very accurately described, these are usually touch and goes. Now it's fair to say that the training captains who do this base training have to have A. A lot of experience, B. Significant simulator experience and C. Big kahunas. Now that middle one is where my speculation stems. Sim training experience. When we operate the sim we're often repositioning it to the final approach or back at the runway holding point. And if I've learned one thing as a sim instructor it's that simulators don't like repositioning. Frequently when we reposition one or more of the flight control computers will go AWOL and the instructor will switch it off and back on again and then all is well. The point I'm making here is that as a regular line shag one would seldom perform a flight control computer reset but as an instructor one may be doing it all the time especially on older sims. A normalization of deviance. Now history shows us that this is dangerous ground as it has been the cause of many an accident not least an Air Asia A320. Now before the APG lawyers get in touch I'm not pointing any fingers of blame. I'm simply providing a possible human factors reason as to why the highly experienced training captain repeatedly reset a computer. Far cleverer people than I will be able to prove or disprove my speculative theory, so I'll leave it there. But suffice to say, in the words of the old lady pilot, fac and sex are not the same. And if you don't know what it does, don't touch it. Captain Al out. I knew there was a, a, a reason I stuck around for that feedback. Um, always very well thought out, um, very He's well a analyzed. Man. Yeah, I would, I would concur with that um, assessment of Captain <laughs> L. He has a way with words, for certain. Um, yes, but no, that's, that's interesting. I mean, you know, that's why having folks like Captain L and, and everyone else out there in our community are so... Um, so valuable because they're able to yeah. fill in some of the blanks that we have that we might not know about that I certainly usually don't know about. And um, yeah, it starts to make a lot more sense or at least some ideas floating around of why things may be happening the way that they are. So definitely speculation, understand that. Um, but, you know, perhaps not outside the realm of the possibility of why. Right. And Captain Elf, thank you so much for taking the time to, to, to record that. And I'm thinking to myself, why didn't we ask him to address this whole thing to begin with? <laughs> next time we will. So, <laughs> yeah, we'll, have, we'll definitely keep that in mind next time. So mm -hmm. thanks for, uh, uh, for doing that. That's uh, much appreciated and uh, makes us all understand the situation a little bit better. All right. Absolutely. So you, 50%. Oh, <laughs> and go. Liz says he's Ding. keeping us above that 50%. Oh, yeah. I have to make the bell sound. Where is my bell? Uh, uh, well, it's got to be here somewhere on my desk. Ah, found it. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Can you hear that? 
Right here, I heard let me get it, it closer yep. to the mic. That's a Very real nice. bell. Okay. Lovely sound. All right, and with that, perfect timing. I have to say good goodbye for the evening, and I feel oh. bad and guilty about this because I'm leaving Jeff all alone. Oh, that's but okay. We're going back that's to okay. the uh, I get... OG uh, yeah. Mainline Pilot Guy show here. Exactly. Yeah, this will be yeah. fun. All righty. It... Well, I will definitely catch you next week. Plans to be. All right. Very good. We'll see okay. you, Steph. All right. Have a good one. Thank Bye-bye. you all for the birthday wishes again. I appreciate it. And I'm off to go um, use up another box of Kleenex for my sniffles. I think. Oh, have fun with that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye. All right. So, oh, look, it's just, well, I, it's not just me. I have, I have Liz here in my, in my ear. Uh, so I'm not alone. Although, you know, for those of you watching the video, you're thinking that I am. Never walk alone. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, this is, you know, it's been a while. So you you were saying Liz, that, uh, it's, it's almost my, the 10th anniversary, I guess. Uh, yeah, it was a May of, uh, so I think, yeah, it's right around 10 years ago when I rebranded my podcast to the airline pilot guy show, but actually I started my podcast, uh, entitled Catholic pilot back in September, I think of 2009. So a year and a half before then. So been going for a while. Let's do that. Well, here's a toast. Of course, I don't have anything in my glass anymore, but uh, here's to APG. There we go. And then pretending I'm drinking something. Okay. There we go. All right. So, um, 10 minutes to go. You know, it's not a, it's not um, something that's set in concrete or anything that we play the plain tale um, at the exact two hour mark. Uh, but we'll keep it as close as we can to that point. And uh, let me continue with some more feedback. And this one is from Logan. And he says, hey, crew, just came across this from yesterday. He didn't, he said it much better than that. He said, hey, crew, there we go. Just came across this from yesterday, May 17th. The flight came from John F. Kennedy and was en route to SFO. I know you've recently talked about the fines associated with these kind of flight disturbances, but my concern with this particular incident uh, is if this guy was snorting coke in the bathroom, how did he get it through security? And if it was, if he was able to get it through how much or how, yeah, how much drug stuff are actually uh, making it onto planes. Again, that's Logan Lynch and the article that he's to which he's referring is from NBCnews.com, and the t- the headline is JetBlue passenger acting erratically forces landing in Minneapolis airline says, and this is from what is the uh, NBCnews.com? I, I already said that. Okay, um, an unruly passenger acting erratically and aggressively toward crew aboard a JetBlue flight forced it to into a, an unscheduled landing in Minneapolis. Uh, Mark Anthony Scarbo, or Cerbo, a 42-year-old resident of Mechanicville, New York. I thought it was Mechanicsville. I think they dropped an S there. Uh, New York was booked on suspicion of drug possession. Minneapolis-St. Paul International Airport Police said. JetBlue Flight 915 was on its normal run from New York's John F. Kennedy International to San Francisco International Airport on Sunday when it was forced to divert to Minneapolis after a customer on board began acting erratically and aggressively toward. Okay. We kind of already covered that. Uh, the flight was met by law enforcement and the customer was removed and the flight continued on to San Francisco. Um, looks like that, um, cell phone video recorded aboard the flight and an attendant could be heard telling passengers that a passenger allegedly touched another passenger refused to wear a mask, and made repeated trips to the bathroom. Well, if you're drinking a lot, you'll do that. Um, It was decided that all four flight attendants felt uncomfortable uh, with what was going on. This was the closest place to go, so we as a team made the decision to come here, Minneapolis. Anyway, um, so basically Logan's question is, okay, so they they ended up um, finding uh, evidence of coke, cocaine on the gentleman white powdery substance, I think, and uh, asking how was it that he got it through security. And so 
I think that's a good question. I'm not entirely positive uh, how that happened, except to say that um, unless you have some kind of a sniffing, um, you know, drug sniffing kind of a device or a dog that's trained uh, to be able to pick up the scent of cocaine or other drugs, um, just putting the bag through the uh, x-ray machine uh, going through, um, you know, whether it's checked or, or uh, carry on, um, I don't think it will be able to differentiate between um, any kind of a powder. I mean, was this, is this powdered sugar? Is this uh, talcum powder that he has in a shaving kit? Um, or is it cocaine? Um, I, I think that there it requires much more um, and different types of equipment to yeah, sophisticated kind of equipment to to uh, pick up on that kind of thing. Again, I don't know for sure. I'm just kind of speculating myself how something like that could make it through security. Um, so maybe somebody out there listening who has um, information about this sort of thing can uh, enlighten us about how how it was that he was able to get this through security. So I do know that even <laughs> like big giant pieces of metal like pistols and that kind of thing uh, make it through and knives make it through security all the time um and it's pretty shocking actually when you see the the cache of weapons that make it through security every year even with all the sophisticated devices that we have to uh to uh you know catch that kind of thing so and detect it okay um that's that's all I can really say about that. Thank you, Logan. Um, oh, we got some feedback from Liz. Um, yeah, she's she sent in some pictures. Uh, now we had been talking about this. Uh, several people have uh, sent us feedback about this, and we, you know, this is a subject that is near and dear to us. And it's the uh, fire bombers. I think they call those things, right? Water bombers. And uh, here's some pictures of uh, the X Flyby. Um, I guess those are ATR. Um, what do they call those things? Uh, no, those are uh, De Havilland um, Dash Eights. Yeah. And uh, but I think the reason that you um, decided to put this in our feedback, Liz, was because you said. Um, they still have the Flybee colors on it, so they're not owned by Flybee anymore, right? I, I don't think they're just leased, uh, but apparently, yeah. So you know, it's 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 you know, it's expensive to repaint an airplane, and so why not just leave whatever livery is already on the uh, airplane? But uh, there you go. It looks like Flybee's out there dropping water on fires, <laughs> and it's actually not Flybee, but it you know, was owned at one point by them, but, uh, still a pretty airplane. So thank you, uh, listener Liz for sending in that feedback. Okay. Um, let me get back there. There we go. Okay. It is now time. A control room is directing me. Uh, it's time now for us to play this week's installment. Now, I should uh, mention that, you know, Nick is uh, not with us this week and he was busy with many things uh, in building up to this uh, holiday that he and his lovely wife, Jilly, took. And uh, so we suggested to him, why don't we play a plain tale that we've played in the past? And Because several people that are listening to the show right now uh, are new and they haven't heard all of, I mean, I, I forgot how many plain tales there are, but it was, it's well over 200 and not quite 300 yet, I believe. And so there's a good chance that uh, if you're a new listener, you've never heard this one. And I think uh, Nick was saying that this is one of his favorites. And uh, so um, we're going to replay that. And without further ado, let me push the button here and uh, give you this week's installment of the Old Pilot's Plain Tales. The Old Pilot's Plain Tales Coca Abel Peter Tokyo Nan Item Canada King As the apocryphal tale goes, there was a major at the front 
who, on surveying the enemy forces ahead of him, saw a perfect chance to attack. However, his small force wasn't sufficient to grasp the opportunity. Hastily, he told his sergeant to get a message to the general. Send reinforcements, we're going to advance. The lines of communication to the general, sitting happily in a villa some distance back, were somewhat complicated. The sergeant ran to the telephone operator and told him what to say. Getting quickly onto the blower, the telephone man contacted the radio station and shouted the message down the crackly line. The radio man smartly fired up his set, and tuning it in, passed the message on. Next it was given to a runner, who in turn told it to a motorcycle dispatch rider. Ploughing through craters and potholes, the dispatch rider drove up to the villa. He was far too dirty to be allowed into the presence of the general, so the officer of the day was called. He listened to the message and strode to the general's aide-de-camp. Having been given the message and looking a little puzzled, the aide-de-camp climbed the stairs and knocked politely on the door of the general's dining room. On being called in, he sidled up beside the general, who was enjoying a nicely hung pheasant, and spoke into his ear. "'Sorry to disturb you, sir,' he muttered obsequiously. "'A message from the front. The major requests, send three and fourpence, we're going to a dance.' And so it was that the phonetic alphabet was created. Well, not quite, but back before the First World War, when communications weren't quite up to the high-fidelity quality that we're used to, there was a real need for a telephonic spelling alphabet. It wasn't as if there suddenly appeared a single alphabetic code that everyone used, because various different ones popped up all around the world. Even by the Second World War, many nations still used their own different version. The U.S. used the Joint Army-Navy Radio Telephony Alphabet. This became known as the Abel Baker, after the first two letters, and a similar one was also in common use with the Royal Air Force. This one was similar to the Royal Navy phonetic alphabet created in the First World War. A couple of the words are still in common use amongst civilians. F for Freddy and S for Sugar. As World War II progressed, America, Australia and Britain had their versions standardised by the Combined Communications Board into the Charlie Charlie Baker Peter 1, the Combined Communications Board Procedure Number 1. At least we were now all calling a love, easy, tear, tear, easy, Roger, all the same thing. But greater minds were on the job at Harvard University's psychoacoustic laboratory. Here they examined all the various alphabets from the USA, Royal Air Force, Royal Navy, British Army, AT&T, Western Union, RCA Communications and that of the... International Telecommunications Convention. According to a report on the subject, the results show that many of the words in the military lists had a low level of intelligibility, but that most of the deficiencies could be remedied by the judicious selection of words from the commercial codes and those tested by the laboratory in a few instances where none of the 250 words could be regarded as especially satisfactory, it was believed possible to discover suitable replacements. Other words were tested, and the most intelligible ones were compared with the most desirable lists. A final NDRC list was assembled and recommended to the CCB. Some letters were obviously difficult, and some were really messed about with. Let's have a look at N, which in 1920 started off as Nancy, under the Universal Electrical Communications Union, Washington, D.C. code, but became Neufchatel at the International Radio Telegraph Convention, Washington, D.C., 1927. 
Not satisfied with that, in 1932, the Madrid General Radio Communications and Additional Regulations changed it to New York, which survived the 1938 Cairo International Radio Communication Conference codewords and the 1947 Atlantic City International Radio Conference. However, N4 New York became complacent, and at the 1946 ICAO second session of the Communications Division, the same as the joint Army-Navy version, N was changed to NAN, and later Nickel. Nickel had a short life, and next year it was changed into Nancy, and then later in the same year to Norma. Norma managed to keep going for a couple of years until Nectar came along. As sweet as N for Nectar was, although it survived the 1951 ICAO code words changes, it became a chilly November in 1956. November turned out to be a long month, as it lasted to today, some 61 years later. Some letters have had pretty exotic code words. C was Casablanca. Of all the gin joints in all the towns in all the world, she walks into mine. Some seem destined to dash around the world, from Baltimore to Brazil, Hanover to Havana, Madrid to Madagascar, Sardinia to Santiago. Zanzibar to Zululand to Zurich. So we ended up with the modern IKO version, which has remained more or less unchanged since 1956. Alpha Bravo, Charlie Delta, Echo, Foxtrot, Golf, Hotel, India, Juliet, Kilo, Lima, Mike, November, Oscar, Papa, Quebec, Romeo, Sierra, Tango, Uniform, Victor, Whiskey, X-Ray, Yankee, Zulu. The reason for all the changes were defined by the requirements laid out in ICAO in 1948. They must be a live word in each of the three working languages, be easily pronounced and recognised by airmen of all languages, have good radio transmission and readability characteristics, have a similar spelling in at least English, French and Spanish, and the initial letter must be the letter the word identifies. Be free from any associations with objectionable meanings. As more countries joined into the international world of aviation, it became obvious that some words were easily misidentified, particularly with the enormous variety of accents. Testing was conducted among speakers from 31 nations, principally by the governments of the United Kingdom and the United States, and the results gave rise to the list of words we currently use. Not only was the word chosen, its spelling, pronunciation, and syllable emphasis was defined. For example, hotel isn't hotel, it's hotel. Generally speaking, or perhaps more correctly, phonetically speaking, the emphasis is on the first syllable, except for November and Sierra, the middle, Papa and Quebec at the end. Of course, numbers also had to be given the treatment, but they tend to be fairly distinct. However, one should be spoken as if spelt W-U-N. Three is tree, four becomes fowa, five is fife, seven is seven, and nine grows to niner. Whilst the world of aviation and the military were getting themselves standardised, there were, of course, major communication companies that insisted on having their own. Western Union had one in 1912, and AT&T developed their own in 1917. These had strange words like X for Xanthippe, the wife of Socrates, and U for Uppsala, a city in Sweden. Whilst we are all supposed to be able to speak the phonetic alphabet, regardless of where we grew up, I still miss some of the more exotic words of old. 
Who wouldn't want to say Ursula, Coco, Eddystone, Francisco, Dado, Hombre, Tripoli, Valencia, Yolanda, an exquis, or count with Penta, Saxo, Sette, Octo, and Nonna, all used in the past. As much as those might make you smile, the radio operators of the Second World War came up with their own humorous version, which started as A for horses, B for mutton, C for yourself, and continued with such gems as L for leather, N for lope, O for the wings of a dove, P for relief, T for two, V for España, and wife or mistress. In a similar vein, there are many brevity code words that came into use, probably just to formalize what was common slang amongst pilots. These are now formally defined in a NATO publication, but I can see that some have lasted almost from the earliest days. Perhaps the most famous is angels, a term meaning altitude in thousands of feet. For example, Angels 5 is 5,000 feet. A bogey is an unidentified aircraft and always gives rise to a giggle when someone calls a bogey on your nose, whilst a bandit is an identified enemy aircraft. The US multi-service brevity codes even includes tally for the sighting of a target from the old British list, which included the longer version, tally-ho. Tally-ho is a hunting term which dates back to around 1772 and is derived from the far more ancient phrase tally-hot, a war cry which literally mean swords up. Sounds nasty. This is, boringly, not an official FAA-endorsed phrase to be found in the pilot controller glossary, as the civvy world prefers traffic in sight. Others might amuse. Blow through doesn't give warning of Captain Al's likely behaviour after a curry, but indicates that an aircraft will continue straight through a merge and not turn with the target something I was sadly all too familiar with during my days flying the Tornado F3. Feet wet or feet dry is to cross the coast, while posit asks for your position from a landmark. The fox calls vary depending on what weapon is used. Fox 1 is a semi-active radar-guided missile, Fox 2 an infrared-guided missile, and FOX-3, an active radar-guided missile, although in my days, that call was for guns. Out of interest, a mad dog is a visual detection of an AIM-120 or 54 launch. A gorilla is a large force of indeterminate numbers and formation, and if one were to engage it, you might well end up in a furball a call indicating known non-friendly and friendly aircraft are in close proximity to each other. Many are intuitive in that home plate is one's home airfield or ship. Others, many of you will know. Try this one. Bingo. Yep, that's the fuel state needed for recovery, whereas joker is the fuel state above bingo, at which a disengagement or bug-out should begin. Buster is another old one, which means to fly at maximum continuous speed in military power, whilst gate demands maximum speed in American afterburner or British reheat. On the other hand, saunter means to fly at best endurance speed. Some words have even made it into civilian use, since a squawk effectively means the same to both an airline pilot using his ATC transponder and a military pilot with his IFF, identify friend or foe. Another might be Wilco, I will comply. There are literally hundreds, and since I would hate to risk boring you, I will leave you with this please feel free to try to work it out for yourselves. 
Winchester Tumbleweed Bingo, Spike in My Six, Sandwiched Bogey Dope, Parrot Dead, Hold Hands, Scramming Home Plate Weeds. Good luck. I have no idea what he is talking about. <laughs> okay. So, you know, Liz, she's still there. She's in the background. Um, I've asked her to join me on the, on the video, but she's so shy. She doesn't want to. She says something about not having expertise. And I'm thinking, you don't need expertise for this show. <laughs> I'm proof of that. Anyway. Um, so, um, Continue to just be bashful and, and not show up. That's fine with me. They're, they're missing all the wonderful, very witty things that you're saying to me. But, oh well, they're lost. Okay. Apparently so. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Captain Nick. Uh, that was an interesting one. I'm all about the uh, phonetic alphabets. And uh, look forward to next week's installment whatever that may be. All right, let's move on with a little bit more. Uh, we don't have to go for the, for the full show or the full three hours this week. Yeah, we only have a couple of more anyway. So uh, the next one that I see in my uh, lineup is from Robert. And he says that, uh, or he sent us a, uh, a link to a YouTube video. And I think it's a vast aviation video again. And it's about um, a Piedmont uh, Embraer 145. They had a burning smell in the cockpit and they did an emergency return. And uh, he, he thinks they, they handled it very well. And I agree. So let's uh, go over here to the share button and I'll find that video file and play it for you. Here we go. Again, Bass Aviation. Real Aviation Communications. Piedmont 6201, fly heading 245, runway 27 left, clear for takeoff. Heading 245, 27 left, clear for takeoff, Piedmont 6201. Philadelphia Tower, Piedmont Embraer 145, performing flight 6201 from Philly to Greensboro. Was on the initial climb when the pilots reported a burning smell in the cabin. And tower, Piedmont 6201 needs to return. Would 6201, okay. Can I help you with anything? Yeah, we just got a burning smell in a cockpit. Okay, 6201, maintain 3000. And uh, do you want to come right back in or do you got to run a checklist real quick? Yeah, we can come right back for uh, two summaries if that works. Piedmont 6201, flying 180, I'll call a departure. All right, 180, Piedmont 6201. Piedmont 6201, contact departure 2435. I told them they're going to bring you right back in for 279. All right, over to departure. Thanks for the help, Piedmont 6201. Piedmont 6201, if you're up, turn left, heading 090. Left 090, Piedmont 6201. 6201, thanks. It's going to be Radar Vectors back in here, and you said you got a strong burning smell in the cockpit. Not strong. It, uh, it's kind of laid back for now, but it's still there. Okay. Laid back. Hmm. Laid back smell. Piedmont 6201, because of the uh, equipment that's rolling out just for precautionary things, declare an emergency, and you can expect 27 left. Thanks. And when you get a second, I know you're a little busy. Uh, I need souls on board and fuel uh, remaining in pounds on the aircraft. All right, 25 souls on board and a uh, 5,000 pounds. Piedmont 6201, it's going to be uh, the ILS to 27 left. And uh, are you guys ready to pretty much come right in? Uh, just give us uh, about one more minute. Okay, 6201, that's fine. Turn 10 degrees to the left, and uh, I'll have vectors in here in a minute. 10 left, Piedmont 6201. Oh, I'm sorry, was that uh, Airport 10? Airport vehicle. That's from the Airport 10. I just wanted to confirm the uh, landing runway for the emergency aircraft. It's going to be 27 left. I thought I heard say 27 right earlier. Uh, we thought that initially because the pilot requested it, but we did change it to 27 left. All right, copy that. I'll be with you on mobile by the emergency. Roger. Fox Shot 21. Fox Shot 21. Can you please let me know when the next emergency aircraft is on fire? Can you please let me know when the next emergency aircraft is on fire? Fox 21 will do. <laughs> uh, that's the fire truck. Fox 21. 
They're speeding this up. Piedmont 6201, turn left 350 for your base. If you're ready to turn in, let me know. If not, I'll take you across. All right, I think 350 ready, Piedmont 6201. Fox Shot 21, good. Give me a call sign of here, Chris. Call sign is Piedmont 6201. Piedmont 6201, turn left 240, join the final. 240, join the final field to site, Piedmont 6201. Piedmont 6201, you are cleared for the visual approach to 27 left. The airspeed is at your discretion. You're in the number one and only one inbound right now. Tower's on 18.5. Clear the visual to 27 left. Tower 18.5, thanks, Piedmont 6201. Anytime, guys. And that's the target team is going to 6201, the visual 27 left. Piedmont 6201, Philly Tower went 240 at section, way 27 left, clear to land traffic, departing party arrival. All right, just about 31, Piedmont 6201. Fox Shot 21, emergency aircraft is the uh, next to land. They're about a four and a half mile bottom. So it's hard for Fox Shot 21, that's the furnace. He had the pilot danger frequency of 120 dash, 125, 120 dash, dot, 125 dash. Okay, I'll do that once they're on the ground. Airport 10 from CR1, proceed on to uh, runway 27 left. Proceed on 27 left from CR1. Piedmont 6201, up to you. You can stay there if you want, or if you're exiting, that's fine. Just let me know what you want to do. Yeah, we'll just exit right here. Piedmont 6201. Okay, 6201. When you're all settled and you can stop there, the uh, fire chief wants you to switch to another frequency so they can discuss everything with you. I guess they're going to check out the aircraft. Let me know when you're ready for the frequency. Yeah, we're ready. 120.425. 20425. All right, we'll switch to 2425, Piedmont 6201. Thanks. Whenever they say they're done with you there, just come back to uh, the tower or ground control. All right, we'll come back to the tower then, Piedmont 6201. Okay, the aircraft was inspected, and then they taxied to the gate. A happy ending. And they did a nice job of uh, handling the uh, emergency. And again, the, just to recap, they smelled something that, probably something that burning smell and they're thinking, well, that's not good. So let's get this airplane on the ground and let, uh, the, uh, me mechanics kind of check it out and see what's going on. Um, you know, better safe than sorry. And, uh, so they did a very nice job of, you know, coming right around uh, the pattern and back to the airport and, uh, love the air traffic control communication, all very professional, uh, very well done, uh, from the uh, air traffic controllers and also the emergency equipment. by the way, the uh, emergency um, uh, crews uh, in the airport vehicle and the fire truck and all that kind of stuff, they were on a separate frequency um, for all of that. So that's why they were asking questions like what's the call sign and which runway were they going to and that kind of thing. But uh, Mass Aviation put it all together for us so we could kind of hear what was going on. Lane has an important <laughs> observation. He whom smelt it, dealt it. Well, I guess maybe you could kind of uh, call that a burning uh, smell, possibly. I don't know if I'd, I'd call it that. <laughs> they may have had something hot for dinner last night, that's for sure. Maybe some Indian cuisine, I don't know. Thai, spicy stuff. Yeah, anyway, job well done to the uh, Piedmont uh, Embraer 145 crew for, uh, yeah, uh, Liz, <laughs> Liz is saying that she wishes that Nick was here, uh, so that, uh, he could hear how professional these air traffic controllers were at Philadelphia. Now, remember, this is not JFK, <laughs> uh, his favorite place for controllers. All right. Um, continuing on, uh, Lyle. You know what? I'm going to save L Lyle's feedback because I think this would be a good discussion uh, with the other crew members. Um, and I think we'll just end with, it's going to be a nice, uh, a shorter show for a change. And this is a, gr a great way to end the show. And this is from Gustav. Gustav is from Sweden. And when I first read this, I have to admit, I'm thinking, well, there might be something that he just doesn't understand. It might be you know, something lost in translation or something. Uh, and then I realized that he was just being very clever. Um, so, and this is a personal note to me. He said, good day, Captain Jeff. Hope all is well. 
and I also hope that it is quite all right if I offer some career advice for you. You see, I have identified an opportunity to have an amazing story to tell at the end of your career. It's quite simple and will only take some minor minor effort from your side. I'm sure you can handle it. Hmm, I'm thinking, this is interesting. Presently, you fly the 717. Previously, you flew the 727. Now Acme flies now Acme flies the 737. So I suggest that you, as soon as possible, transition to that fine bird, then just as quickly move on to the 75767 line before the age of 63. Now I have to pause here for a moment. I'm 62 and a half right now. <laughs> that would be a tough thing to do in uh, six months, get qualified. <laughs> on two different, uh, and I couldn't do it anyway contractually. But anyway, that's beside the point. Uh, so do the 7-3 and the seven five seven six line before the age of 63 so that you can end your career at 64 flying the 777 for Acme. Okay, well, we're, we don't even fly the 777 anymore. Why end your career at 64, you ask? Well, here, this is where Miami Rick comes in. You see, if he could get you into Acme Giant, you could spend your 65th year here on Earth flying the 747. And after all, those previous Boeing models, this should be no problem at all. As a kicker, as soon as you turn 65, you can go to the route of the handsome Captain Jeff and get a Part 135 gig flying one of those Boeing business jet 787s as the 787 shares a type rating with the 777. This should cause you very little trouble at this stage. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then he uh, sent us a link to uh, the name of the headline of this from Simple Flying is Flying Mansion 787. Yeah, that would be a nice private jet, wouldn't it? 787. Wow. That way, when you finally retire, most likely quite wealthy at that stage with only a few gray hairs, I think, well, see, I have all gray hair right now. I guess he means just only a few gray hairs left on my head, so mostly bald. Uh, you'll you'll be able to say, oh, I flew the 717, 727, 737, 747, 757, 767, 777, and the 787, and a steamship. <laughs> I guess he's referring to the Mad Dog. And you'll never have to buy another beer again. While you get your books out and call the chief pilot, Captain Jeff, perhaps Miami Rick can explain how the 787 and the 777 can share the same type rating. Take care. Gustav from Sweden. <laughs> yeah, that is very, very funny, Gustav. Um, yeah, it would it would be quite, quite something. You know, I'm sure there are uh, pilots out there that probably can say that They've flown and are type rated all, all those all those airplanes. Probably not a lot of pilots that can say that, but I will definitely not be one who will be able to. No, I I think I've gone through my last my last uh, upgrade training or different airplane training. I don't. I'm not sure I've had have any left in me. Uh, now you know you never say never, but uh, yeah, I think that uh, the Boeing seven one seven you know, in uh, air quotes, uh, will be my last qualification and type rating. Actually, type rating, I should, I should mention that the Boeing 717, the MD-88, the MD-90, all have the same type rating, and the type rating is as follows, DC-9. That is a DC-9 rating on all those jets. So right now, if you looked at my... Uh, my license, it says uh, the type ratings are just the 727 and the DC-9. That's it. Um, when I flew the uh, L-1011, the Lockheed TriStar, our airline did not require that uh, second officers have a type rating as well as the captain. Now, on all of our fleets, uh, that's ACME's philosophy. Everybody uh, has a type rating. So... Uh, don't have a, it would have been a nice thing to have a, an L-1011 TriStar type rating on my, on my certificate, but oh well, it was fun flying it anyway. And with that, I think it's now time for us to wrap up the show. And um, 
oh, I have to do all this. Usually I have Steph or Captain Nick. Okay, so Liz is going to help me. She's going to put up some banners here. So first of all, uh, check out our website. Arash Mahin um, does a wonderful job of uh, managing the uh, website and the website traffic and all that kind of stuff and helping me get all that set up. And it's airlinepilotguy.com. And uh, lots of stuff there, uh, information about the crew and the community. And uh, what did I add to the website this week? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Liz is telling me to tell you, dear listeners, that I added something to the website. And it's really just a link. I set up a separate page um, that because I mentioned last week. Um, was it last? Yeah, it was last week. Um, and Steve and Ivy, uh, and I had a, a little meetup in, uh, Cobb County and, uh, had a, had a lunch on a Sunday afternoon. And I was talking about the fact that Steve and Ivy and I, about just about, uh, just shy of a year ago, uh, took a, uh, road trip across the country. Uh, Stephen was moving, uh, one of his cars out to Southern California for a new job. And he asked if I would, you know, be willing to be, uh, his, companion, his co-pilot on his uh, trip out to California in his uh, Prius. And I went, yeah, that'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. I'm not doing anything. You know, that was the time frame where the uh, mad dog was uh, retired and uh, was waiting for my training on the 717 at that point. So off we went and I recorded, um, or we recorded uh, some audio for, I think just about every day of the trip and we entitled it road trip. And, uh, and to make it easier for you to uh, listen to that road trip, if you didn't get a chance to, um, I put them all together on one page on the website and um, a, a link to it. And so uh, while I'm talking about it now, I'll try to remember to uh, put that link to that page in this episode as well so you can uh, check it out because it, it was a lot it's, it was fun for me to, listen to it again and kind of relive the, uh, the great adventure that we had and yeah, some good pictures that we took. Um, and, uh, the, uh, some of the most memorable parts of the trip, um, really happened, uh, out West and, uh, in Colorado, we, uh, stopped in, um, Oh, Durango. Thank you. Durango, Colorado, where they have that small gauge steam, uh, locomotive, uh, train, that uh, goes up um, the the river up to uh, some uh, mining towns and that kind of thing. Uh, at the time, though, it was uh, during the year of COVID uh, in 2020, and they didn't have it going all the way up. It was like halfway up the normal route. I think it was about an hour and a half train ride up, and then it turned around and came back. But it was still a lot of fun. Uh, it was a, quite an experience. And then uh, we went from there up into Utah. Uh, Utah's has many, many national parks, and we went to a couple of them, um, Arches, and um, I'm trying to remember the other one that we went to, Canyonlands, that's right. And uh, and then we, uh, from there, went to Hurricane, <laughs> Utah, and uh, got, some, uh, got some rest, and then the next day, we were headed for the Grand Canyon, and we went all the way around, had to go all the way down to, uh, uh, to, um, um, why am I having a oh Flagstaff Flagstaff because the um, the uh, Indian reservation access from coming in from the east that was all shut off because they okay Liz is uh, taking a little break um, and uh, so we were uh, kind of cut off from that um, access to the, uh, the south rim of the Grand Canyon so we had to go all the way down to Flagstaff and then up from there to the uh, South Rim. And uh, so that was nice seeing the South Rim of the Grand Canyon. And then finally from there, we headed up toward Vegas, uh, Las Vegas, and uh, uh, Parump, I think is the name of the town, kind of an unusual named town, uh, just past Las Vegas, uh, just outside of uh, um, Death Valley. And uh, we uh, got to check out Death Valley. And then after we made our way through Death Valley, I think it was after we... Um, went through, no. Oh, you know what? I, I forgot about the fact that we went through Zion National Park. We didn't really stop. We kind of just drove through a part of it um, when we were going from Moab, Utah to uh, 
Hurricane um, Utah, uh, but it was still pretty. Got to see some mountain goats and that kind of thing. Anyway, so it was a great trip. And uh, and then at the end of it all, um, I um, parted with uh, Stephen and I uh, took a train from Los Angeles to New Orleans. I think, what would they call that? The Crescent something or other. And, um, and then uh, after New Orleans, I think that was the last thing that I recorded was our, my trip from Los Angeles to, uh, to New Orleans. And then after that, uh, the next day, went from New Orleans to Atlanta. And that was the end of my whirlwind trip. It was a lot of fun. So check it out uh, if you want to uh, hear all the, all the fun that we had and see some pictures and that kind of thing. So there we go. So uh, lots of other good stuff on the website. We are also on social media. I like to call it the social meds. Um, oh, by the way, we're popping up the, if you want to send feedback to the show, you can send it to feedback at airlinepilotguy.com. And that includes audio feedback. If you have a, um, some kind of an iOS or Android device uh, and has some kind of a sound recording app on it, you can use that and then attach it to your email. Send it at feedback at airlinepilotguy.com. Also on the website, we have a link to, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, sound, um, speak pipe. Thank you. <laughs> speak pipe. And that's on the website. Anyway, lots of different ways to send us feedback. And, uh, on social meds, uh, on Facebook, we're airline pilot guy, all one word. And on Twitter, all, uh, the entire crew is on APG crew at APG C R E W APG crew. And on Instagram, same thing, APG crew, all one word. There you go. That's our social media presence. And now see, normally when somebody else is talking about the social meds, I am getting all queued up to, uh, no, I, I prefer- oops, nope. Well, I'm glad that one didn't come out. <laughs> Um, I get ready to, uh, talk about Slack. Actually, I don't talk about it. Hillel talks about it. So let me see if we can, uh, find Hillel in the bathroom here. So yes, I have a hidden microphone in the bathroom. Don't ask me why. Hello. Camera two. Hello. Slack. Okay. But I'm dripping wet. All right. All right. It's fine. Just come over here. Walk over here. Now, this is the tough part because he's just come out of the, he's dripping wet. He just came out of the shower. Uh, hang on. Let me move out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm averting my eyes, so I don't see this. But he, yeah, thankfully he's put a towel around himself. Okay. Now, would you please tell everybody about Slack? APG listeners, please join us on our Slack team. Slack is a communication, coordination, and sharing platform that works on your mobile, laptop, or browser. On Slack, we share news and ideas. We suggest episode and plain tales topics. We plan events and meetups. To get into the Slack team, please email me at slack at airlinepilotguy.com. That's S-L-A-C-K, Sierra Lima Alpha Charlie Kilo at airlinepilotguy.com. Or send me a tweet with your preferred email address to at Hillel, and I'll send you an invitation. That's Hillel, spelled Hotel India 11 Echo 1, and see you in Slack. All right. And thank you, Hillel, for that. Always appreciated. And now, Liz, please, would you pop yourself into our, our Hello. Video? There you are. Hello. Okay. And uh, so there she is, our, uh, our producer, director, and my assistant, and so much more. She's like a girl Friday, right? And, That's me. Um, this is the control room, a very, very nicely appointed control room that we're uh, looking at here. So uh, thank you so much, Liz, for thank you. all the work you do behind the scenes. And uh, here's, here's my straight. assistant. Here's my assistant. Oh, ah, look at that. There's, uh, there's Poppy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lane was so asking cute. about Poppy. So, Yeah. How, now, how uh, old is Poppy now? And Poppy will be uh, 10 months old in uh, the middle of June. June 11th. Okay. Yeah. Oh, she is so pretty. She's a good girl. so well behaved. Well, right. she's getting there. Yeah. For a puppy, she's pretty yeah. good. All right. So, yeah, she, she manages all of what we do here on the show and Poppy and Jack, her cat. Mm-hmm. Of course, the mm-hmm. cat's usually pretty self contained. Yeah. He's... Probably not a lot you have to do with Jack. <laughs> there you go, Lane. Right. There she is. 
There is Poppy. All right. Well, thanks, Liz, uh, for popping in. Thank you, and, Jeff. My uh, pleasure. Thank you for all the stuff that you do. Thanks, everybody. All right. And until next time, wishing you all clear skies, unlimited visibility, and tailwinds. Take care and God bless. Bye, everybody. There we go. Perfect. Oh, you know what? We forgot to tell Steph to stop her recorder. <laughs> Maybe we can. I'll say we'll send, send her a message. Yeah, I'll yeah, send, send her, her a message, her a message yeah. and let her know that she needs, because I was just looking down at my recording yeah. console and I'm thinking I need to stop my recorder. There we go. I think I, I'm the only one that can hear that little beeping sound that it makes when I hit the stop button. All right. Well, I, re I remember to hit the record button. That's always a good thing. All right. Thank you, everybody, for uh, joining us today. And uh, this is, of course, everybody knows that's here in the chat room um, that uh, this is when we start asking for uh, title ideas for this week's episode. Yeah, I don't have a whole bunch, I'm afraid. Yeah, we talked about a bunch of different things. Thank you, main man Micah. Good night. Tony Smith, Mike Kuypers, if you're still with us, thanks for yep, he's still there, hanging please. with us. Okay, good. Uh, Lane Street, Neil Lanwarm, Graham Fig. Hello, my APG friends. Today we had the greatest fun in Santa Rosa to Scottsdale, Arizona, flying over. Oh, Yosemite Mammoth Lake, Grand Can. Wow, Las Vegas and Lake Hood. Wow, yeah, brilliant. You're right. Quite a number of great sights to see. All right, and many, many more of you are here with us. Citing citations, mm. or citing a yeah. citation. I don't. I think yeah, we didn't know that that was a citation, did we? We just sort of no, it wasn't, were playing it around. Wasn't a no, was it? Could we no, do something I, with I, smells in the cockpit? Um. Yeah. Um, I'm not quite sure how we could illustrate that, but we had smells in the cockpit. Um, and then um, Mike's audio there, uh, we were talking. He was talking about hail and stuff. We could do something about like what the hail. Oh, what the hail! What yeah. the hail! That's cute. I'm not um, quite sure again what we do with that, but no. Again, mm. we're always trying to think of like artistic things for Nick to come up with. Uh, let's see. I'm Could we do something with here. Darren's rocket launch? Uh, the APG, oh, yeah. the APG launch site or something. I don't know. Yeah. That's an idea. APG launch pad. APG launch pad. Okay. An mm -hmm. idea. Um, all the, uh, all Gustav's uh, the last piece of feedback. I Gustav's love that. Getting checked out on all those airplanes. I mean, that would be uh, kind of one of those things where Nick could put all those different airplanes that he mentioned. Jeff does the Boeing uh, Grand Slam. Yeah. Uh, out to launch. <laughs> That's cute. That's a good one. That's good, Mike. Yeah. Oh, hail, smelly owl in the pit. <laughs> There's so much uh, material in owls. I don't want to go there. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I was thinking backup sex. <laughs> S E C S, not S E X. Because he uh -huh. was not talking about S E X. He was, not. He was talking about no, he well, Supposedly. <laughs> how do you how do you illustrate that? Although maybe Nick could I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm sure that Nick could probably illustrate that, but I don't think that would be family friendly. <laughs> I'll write it down uh, just in case, but. Oh, no. <laughs> okay. All right. You know, he's probably, you know, what he'll have to do. He'll have to listen to the show I know. recording and then kind yeah. of come up with an idea. Put on his you know, creative sometimes, path. Sometimes, you know, at the very end of the show, you've forgotten all the different things that you could have used for a good title um, you know, at I, the end I of I try it. and write them down, but today I didn't. Get yeah. There. And then a lot of times when I'm doing the editing, I go, oh, Man, that would have been a perfect title if I thought about it at the time, but I, I, I didn't. Too many other things for me to think about. Ah, Al's sexy feedback. <laughs> I would be. It would have to be S E C S Y, wouldn't it? Sexy <laughs> feedback. 
Uh, and then we could have a picture of Captain Al in a sexy pose. <laughs> well, every, Al, every pose that Al does exactly. is a sexy pose. <laughs> yeah, that's a given. <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, um, well thanks, everybody. Hope everybody uh, enjoyed the show. We enjoyed uh, bringing it to you. And um, as always, uh, we do appreciate your presence here and your and your help and your uh, just your support all to, all around. And uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and hit the end broadcast button and say goodbye and be well and have a great uh, week and weekend, especially those of you here celebrating Memorial Day weekend in the U.S. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.